it's pretty consistent with what we've been recommending and the town has been awarding for the last few years. Are there questions for Mr. Butterfield? Do you have anything to offer us? No, I, th uh, I do commend the personnel board. They do uh, um, pay attention. To, they, they have met with all, they offered to me with all non-union um, officials who work for the town. They had a meeting in here with a number of people who came in and listened to any issues that came up, but there weren't really many. They were, uh, non-union employees were grateful that the personnel board listens to them, which this personnel board does a lot. And uh, this is in keeping with our um, guidelines for our financial um, uh, projections going forward. Great. Thank you. If there aren't questions, Mr. Yeah, Sandberg. I guess I'm going to say something right now to cover two different items on the agenda tonight. Um, uh, for disclosure purposes, my wife is a part-time employee of the uh, Jones Library System working at the North Amherst Library. And uh, her um, uh, compensation is not affected by the vote this evening, so um, I can participate in this part of the meeting. Um, I'm not going to repeat this because when we get to the library budget, um, I am going to, I may remain at my seat, but I am not going to participate in the discussion or vote on the budget um, for the library because the library budget that we would be recommending to the um, town meeting does include funds that cover salary. So Thank I just you. want to get that full disclosure. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, so if there aren't <coughs> any other questions or, or comments relative to the, uh, the recommendation from the personnel board, I would entertain a motion relative to that. Um, so if someone would like to offer that, it's the first one on our motion sheet. Please, Mr. Grover. Um, I move to approve the recommendation of the Personnel Board, voted March 21st, 2018, that a 2% cost of living increase for eligible, regular, full-time, non-union employees be applied to the non-union salary schedule effective for the fiscal year beginning Sunday, July 1, 2018. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you coming and, and the work you do f for our employees. So next up, just to uh, again accommodate uh, someone who's, who's uh, here for hopefully a fairly brief time, but um, we have under uh, Section 7, Licenses, Public Way and Meter Parking Reservations, we have uh, Charity Wine Pouring License Application from the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst. Uh, the events on 6-8. So if you'd come forward and tell us a little bit, identify yourself at the microphone, uh, and then also just tell us a little bit about your event, and we will find the appropriate sort of place in our, our motion sheets and that sort of thing, but this gives you an opportunity to tell us a little Thank bit so about that. Thank you so much for being so welcoming. Um, the uh, Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst is uh, having our major fundraiser for the year on June 8th, and it will be a, a charity uh, art auction, and it funds a lot of our social justice work and, uh, and uh, our contributions to uh, the needy in the community. Uh, the intention is to have original art, and uh, so we wanted it to be a fairly elegant evening with some uh, piano music and some wine. And, the wine is not the focus of the evening. The art is the focus. It's by way of ambience. And um, so uh, we're connecting it with the art walk and so forth. So that led me on the search for what permits do we need um, because uh, being on the planning committee wanted to make sure that we were doing this right. And uh, I worked my way up to um, Ryan Melville uh, in the state office in Boston, and he said that we needed both a permit from Amherst and uh, for the one-day uh, special wine and malt license, and we also needed the charity wine pouring license um, from the state office. 
And so he said, you start here and you put all the applications together and bring them here. Uh, it's a little bit complicated because it turns out the applications weren't really designed for a religious group, but he told me exactly what documents and uh, that led me to the Attorney General's office and the uh, Secretary of State or, or whatever. And, so I believe we have all the correct documents now <laughs> to um, prove that we are charitable, but in the way that religious groups are uh, nonprofit charitables. And um, he said with that, uh, we could use donated wine, and um, that's what we'd like to do. We're trying to keep the costs down because we're hoping to actually make some money on this. So. Sure, great, thank you. Are there questions for our applicant at all? Mr. Sandberg, uh, do you want to? I guess uh, this one that I normally ask um, of all applicants, um, and uh, so I won't exempt you. Uh, do you have plans in place for monitoring to make sure that uh, minors are not served? Uh, there probably won't be very many minors because <laughs> most of them don't have huge art budgets. But uh, yes, the the wine will. Uh, I will be in charge of the wine table, and um, there will probably be a couple of people helping me. Our expectation is uh, probably one glass of wine, uh, a rare or two. But like I said, this, this is not a major uh, drinking event. And uh, anyone who isn't white-haired, is, we will check their ID. Any other questions for our applicant? If not, I'd entertain a motion. If someone, it's on the, I think it's on the left, um, page three. I move to approve the application of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, uh, a qualifying charity for a special charity wine license to pour at a fundraising event to be held on June 8, 2018 at their usual place of business located at 121 North Pleasant Street, Amherst. Ann Cohn, church member and event co-chair. Is there a second? There is a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that's unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. I do hope you have a lot of uh, fun and success. And, uh, Thank you. Well, come by and look at the art. There should be some good stuff. Thank you all again for being so kind. This is you. this was the, turned out to be the easiest <laughs> whole process. Well, you had done all the legwork already. That's right. Didn't you did all the hard part first. I'm ready to write a little. Really? Thank okay. You. All right. So next up, we'll go back into our, our action and discussion items, and we'll take up our positions and, and hearing about uh, the annual town meeting warrant articles and I believe we'll just take them in order, which we'll start with Article 2, which is the transfer of funds, unpaid bills, and then we'll move on from there. And I think Ms. Aldrich is going to answer our questions about several of the first few that we have here. Good evening. So Article 2 is an uh, annual article that we put on the warrant um, just in case a bill shows up from a prior year that hasn't been encumbered or um, wasn't on our radar. I expect to have the um, finance committee will dismiss this at a meeting prior to town meeting. Okay. So there's no anticipated unpaid bills at this point? Not at all. Okay. Not As on the school side case. either. Okay. Um, I think. Let's just carry on and go to Article 3, which is acceptance of optional tax exemptions, I believe. If you, will you speak to that or? Yep, um, this article has been part of the consent calendar every year and it must be voted every year, allowing the town to grant higher real estate tax exemptions to qualifying property owners than the base level set by the state. Okay. So it's the usual one we deal with with regard to extending optional tax exemptions, correct? Right. Okay. Any questions from the board? I don't want to zip by things if people have questions, but let's move on to uh, Article 4, which is um, fiscal year 2018 budget amendments. Um, article 4 is also a usual article that goes on every um, Springtown meeting. This article allows us to move any 
unspent f or excess funds from one functional area to another. A lot of times we have moved money from functional areas to cover snow and ice instead of using the reserve fund. This year, we're antis we anticipate we're gonna use all of it to cover the health insurance, any surplus to cover the health insurance deficit in fiscal year 18. I don't have the sums of money yet. I should have them before the motion review. Okay. But um, the question I have with regard to this is, so it, it sounds like that that will require a transfer into the general fund, correct? Well, the bulk of it is in the general fund because right. we have our, our um, salary reserve there. Right. So we'll be moving some of that probably into public safety unless there's sufficient savings from vacancies in public safety. Okay. We'll end up moving less of it. But the bulk of it's going to be in general fund already. Okay. So we'll probably be moving more of the funds from the other functional areas. And then do we have a sense of how snow and ice is shaping up relative to what we budgeted? Well, I looked at my phone just before I got here and it says snow tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're saying it's, it's but, still indeterminate. <laughs> but we had an estimate of 200,000, but a large part of that was encumbered for sand and salt. I think most of that's, we're, we're gonna be able to liquidate that encumbrance. So I'm hoping it stays with under 100,000. Right, which would be able to be covered by the reserve fund the finance committee has control of. Or savings in the, um, in the public works department with vacancies. Okay. Doing okay. our best to cover that. Are there other questions? To in the, just great. for the people at home, the reason we have to have this vote is because we vote our um, operating budgets by functional area, general government, public safety, community services, and so on. So because we do that, we have to vote to move them out of those functional areas. And cool. I think next is retirement assessment? Uh, no, five. there's part B. That was part A. Oh, I'm sorry. Then there's part oh, B. This article was put on there in case we needed to move any funds, more funds into the reserve fund. We budget 100,000, but there's been a few years that we've had to appropriate more money in there to cover a larger snow and ice deficit, or this year we had the um, North Fire Station boiler break on us. That was about um, I believe 58,000 ended up in the end. We're hoping there's going to be savings from other parts of public safety to cover a part of that. So we may not need this. But so I won't know that until has the um, next week. It's not the Board of Registers, is it? Um, who is it that controls the overlay surplus account and declares the Board surplus? Of assessors. Board of Assessors. Mm -hmm. Have they met and declared a surplus, or are they waiting until we know? We're we waiting need to them see to? if we need it. Okay. Okay, and then Part C is asking the town to appropriate a sum of money from free cash into the health claims trust fund. We cannot, by law, have a deficit in our health claims trust fund at year end. So we are trying to estimate the best we can what that deficit is going to be. I can say that our health claims trust fund is still, the expenses are still outpacing the revenues. So there will be a deficit. The amount of that, I, I don't have a number right now. We're gonna try our best to estimate that. We may end up, we may move money in there and still end up with a small deficit. It's, it's just something we can't project. On yes. That. So what would happen in that case, we would transfer money from free cash into the trust fund um, to make sure the trust fund was balanced. But then over the course of the next two years, we have a plan for repaying the town for f right. moving this money in, into this trust fund from both uh, surcharges placed on employees' paychecks and charges to the town of Pelham, the town of Amherst, and the re regional school district as well. And I just want to comment that we call it a surcharge, but in reality, it's a premium. We are all responsible, the employers and the employees for the Health Claims Trust Fund. So any deficit, we call it a surcharge because it's not permanent, like a premium is. So I just wanted to clarify that. So just one other thing on that. So we don't know how much this is going to be. So the employees wanted to know a fixed dollar amount, how much would the surcharge be? And we put that number in. And so we know, and, and as soon as that surcharge pays back this amount, 
that surcharge will go away. We have tried to budget it within a two-year period. But the surcharge is also for, it's for any deficit in the health claims trust fund at year end, but it's all, it also has to cover the run out because we will get our bills for June and July and August. So it'll have to cover that too. All right. Any other questions for the Ms. Aldrich on, on Article five, uh, 4? Let's move to Article 5, which is retirement assessment. Um, the town, as a member of the Hampshire County Retirement System, pays an annual assessment that covers benefits to current retirees and funding for future retirees. The amount this year is uh, $5,565,471. This is an increase of 408051 from last year. Any questions? Yeah, I guess on this one I did, because uh, you had also indicated in your memorandum to the board that uh, it's 7.9 percent is the amount of the increase that over the prior year and uh, that's more than the uh, general increase in the budget and I was uh, I, I know that it's based upon a number of factors and if you could just give us a little bit of a um, rundown as to why the number is higher than the increase, substantially higher really than the increase in the overall budget for the years. Well, they, they based the assessment on this last September payroll. So um, sometimes it's lower if someone comes off the payroll the first week in September, a higher paid employee, that estimate could go down. if. Um, someone's leaving and we hired somebody in place, it could go up. It's, it, it, it's just based on the last payroll of September for the, for the subsequent year, is Wh it, what's ever paid out on payroll. Isn't it also based on a, a bit of an average over a period of time of the performance of the, <coughs> of the um, for lack of a term, the trust. Uh, it's not the health care claims trust, the retirement system. Their funds and how they perform also makes a difference, right. correct? Right. It is. I just don't know. I'm not into the weeds of it, so I don't know those answers. Okay. Any other questions on Article 5 on the retirement assessment? Yes. I have a question. If I'm remembering this. Um, isn't the county retirement system trying to reach a certain level at a certain period? So there's, there's a kind of accelerated... It, it raises the amount now because they're trying to reach a certain mm -hmm. level by 2030 or something. So these numbers are pretty high. It doesn't mean that they'll always escalate at that level. If I I'm, believe so. I can't. Yeah, so, so there is a 30-year funding plan to make us whole. Uh, and there's, I think we're in year six of that 30 years, a long-term plan, but it, all communities have to fully fund their obligations going forward, but they give you time to get there. So this is part of that process. So that's partly why those numbers are so high yeah. now. I believe the last date I heard that we would be fully funded, it was 2033. 2033, right. Yeah. Also, if we pay this all up front at one lump sum, then we, we save 2%. So we, we, we do that every year. Oh, pay our assessment at the, the beginning annual. of the fiscal year, correct? And that right. gets us a, right. an early payment discount, pretty good which is pretty significant. Yeah. So we're fortunate we can do that. And so let's move on, unless there's another question on retirement assessments. We'll go to regional lockup assessment. Um, the town as a user of the Hampshire County, County Regional Lockup pays an annual assessment based on population to cover the operating costs of the lockup. Our assessment. Um, has been the same the last few years, 35,928. So there's been no indication from, from the, uh, essentially the Sheriff's Department that they're in need of a greater amount of funding, I presume? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. We won't, we won't go and call them up and ask. I don't need to. I can make that call. To no, that's that. really all right. Um, Isn't yes. that formula set? Probably by statute, not. It's not actually, but what, there was an agreement amongst the communities of the, in concert with the, because I was on the finance committee when this came into being, because oh. the first few years that there was the regional lockup, it was fully funded by the state, and the state said to the communities that are members, you've got to, to carry a, 
a certain part of the share. And what they came to was an agreement of about basically one dollar per capita. Right, and, this and that's held like, steady. So, if I might, this yes. looks like our population figure from the last census. So, exactly. when we get to the next biennial, we can expect that to go up. Most likely. Exactly. Most likely. Yes. So let's go to Article 7, please. Other post-employment benefits, OPEB trust fund. The town um, continues to contribute to the trust fund as possible from the general fund, increasing the amount to 500 from 400 last year. We started off at 100. We've worked our way up to 500,000 a year. The enterprise funds contribute at a rate recommended for fully funding their obligation. Um, that's it. So the question I have, and I think this is maybe more for the manager, is um, so we've gotten to the $500,000 mark in future years. Are you looking to continue to increase that by 100000 or are you looking to hold that steady for the short term? You know, do we have a plan to, you know, the, the original plan we saw when Mr. Pooler was here a few years ago was to get up to the 500000 but that's about as far into the future as, as uh, he had sort of laid out the spreadsheet, quite frankly. I mean, it was a, an arc to get to 500000 I was just wondering um, whether you had any thoughts about future years and where we might go from here. Right now I think we would hold steady because there are a lot of demands on our budget and we also are trying to ex um, increase the amount that we devote to capital, which is probably at this moment in time a higher priority for this. But I think if we level off at 500000 we'd be in pretty good shape to do that. Any other questions relative to the uh, OPEB trust fund? Okay, so before we get into Article 8, which is the operating budget, there are a couple of sections of that, um, and this gets to what Mr. Steinberg said earlier about his uh, relationship relative to the libraries, I being an employee of the schools. There are two parts of this budget, the regional school uh, assessment appropriation and the elementary school budgets, um, you know, that, that you know, affect me, and so during that portion of, the, of, of that conversation, I'll again recuse myself from any conversation in that regard, but if you want to take us through the operating budget, please. Yeah, I believe I'm just reporting on this article as being the operating budget for the town. I believe you're, you're meeting with the schools next week on it, and the library is here for tonight. Great. So um, Article 8 is the fiscal year 2019 operating budget, and this is where all of our budgets are voted, including the um, schools, the library, debt service, and enterprise funds. The town's, the town's portion on your sheets is highlighted gray. Um, is the 23,844,470. That's what you will see in, on the projection sheets. That is the town's portion. Um, covers general government, public safety, public works, conservation and development, and community services, and that's basically the municipal part. Then we have debt service, which is a separate, a separate vote, and this includes CPA debt. So there will be a funding source from taxation and CPA of 320-843. And then this, the enterprise funds, which are all voted separately. And I don't really know what else to say about this. I'll just ask this quick question regarding the enterprise funds. We, as the Water and Sewer Commissioners, did a rate increase. Mm -hmm. And so that is factored into those budgets as well, correct? It is, yes. Okay. yes. So I'll make that clear. Um, so since we're going gonna, gonna to skip the library for a second and let Ms. Aldrich, continue on if that's all right. And so if you go to Article 9 in the Reserve Fund, we'll back to the Library Services budget in a minute. This is another annual appropriation for the town to appropriate $100,000 for the Reserve Fund um, transfer. And this is under the control of the Finance Committee for um, extraordinary and unforeseen expenses that may occur, like snow and ice and a boiler crashing in the middle of the year. I realize this is for fiscal year 19. I realize that we are probably, we're, we are going to be a charter halfway through the year. This is the budget going forward for 2019 for at least half the year. And then, then there's a group of us meeting for all the um, 
charter changes and we'll figure it out from there. Do you have a question? Yeah, I actually <laughs> corresponded a little bit with uh, Ms. Aldridge about this. There's two separate statutes that um, are very close to each other in the uh, Mass General Laws that cover reserve funds for towns and for cities, and they're fairly similar. Um, they set a cap on the amount, which is not an issue for us, um, uh, because we're well under the cap as to the amount that can be contributed. Um, <coughs> and the um, amount um, that is put into a fund is within the control of a finance committee for a town. It's in, um, it's in the control of the commission uh, are, are, of, um, excuse me, the council for a uh, city. So that um, partway through um, the fiscal year for which we're appropriating, the power to make the decision on expending the funds <coughs> will shift. Um, but since the motion, that are, are the, uh, actually the, I'm assuming the um, motion will be in terms of the article. The article just sets aside money into reserve fund. Um, it's so generally stated that I think that the reserve fund is likely to just transfer to the new form of government. And so the only uh, amendment really is an explanation amendment as opposed to a uh, need for a change of any other kind. And, Any other questions regarding the reserve fund? If not, please continue to Article 11. Article 11 um, is a general bylaw. This was an article that comes up every year. It was for um, reauthorizing our revolving fund for the after school program. <clears throat> and with the Municipal Modernization Act, it is now required that we, have a, we put a bylaw in place. And this requires that we establish a bylaw for authorization that specifies um, which the amount being spent, the source of funds going into the revolving fund, the department authorized to expend the funds, and the maximum, the maximum amount you can spend. Once this bylaw is in place, we will no longer have to have it voted every year unless we want to change any of the thresholds unless we want to change from the 400 to more or less then we'd have to amend the bylaw or if we wanted to add any more revolving funds of this type you would have to amend the bylaw so this is again we're sort of because we're straddling two different forms of government nonetheless this is required by my mass by that recent uh, municipal modernization act if we were continuing town meeting, this would save us time every spring, and I guess it'll save the council time in the future because they won't have to take this up every year when they do their budget as well. Exactly. Okay. Any other on that? All right. And <coughs> Article 25, free cash. Oh, well, I'll just do 25 and 26 That's together. Fine. These do. are these are put on here every year and are used to balance the budget as a source of appropriations for those um, town meeting votes that are added that have appropriations. Just as a quick reminder for folks that aren't familiar with this, uh, free, free cash <laughs> requires majority. Free <coughs> cash requires a simple majority to appropriate funds, whereas the stabilization fund requires a two thirds to yes. appropriate money. And free cash isn't free. And it's not free. <laughs> we hope it earns a little interest sometimes, but and it's not it cash. Doing much of that. Any other questions? Are there any other questions just in general for, for Ms. Aldrich on, on these articles? If not, then we'll thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate okay. that. Um, would the board like to take positions on those or do we wanna kind of keep going and then come back to positions later? I'm, up, I'm, sig I'm not predisposed to Even either Even how many one. people are waiting for other things. More. All right, that's kind of what I, I was. Drag everyone through. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking it's as well. But. Uh, so I believe now we're on to, uh, we're back to Article 8, and we're going to talk specifically about the, the library services budget. So if, if our library director would please join us. And 
take us through. I believe tonight on our desks we got a, 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 a copy of the proposed fiscal 19 budget for the library. So I, I presume this is color cover the document you're going to take us through? Yeah. Right. Okay, great. I actually feel tall. Can, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Is this? Okay. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our new, the library's new business manager. This is John Shannon. Uh, for the past five years, he's been self-employed as the director of Terra Consulting in Amherst. Prior to this, he worked as a manager at Barings Asset Management in Springfield. Uh, his bookkeeping, accounting, marketing, human resources skills have already made a wonderful addition to our library system. So I just wanted you all to put a name to a face. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So in a nutshell, just as is the case for all the other town departments, health insurance is killing us. By the end of this fiscal year, all our reserves will have been spent, and for next year, the trustees have increased the endowment draw rate to four, from four to five percent. It will result in an increased contribution to our budget of $74,000. So five percent is a responsible draw, draw rate, but it is by no means ideal. This is especially true if, as we expect, returns on investments will be substantially lower in the future as they have been in the very recent past. For FY19, we will be relying exponentially on fundraising to close our budget gap. Uh, here's my shameless plug, plug. I encourage all of you uh, to go and buy tickets to the Sammies. So tonight, when you go home and you're in your bunny slippers, go onto our website uh, and buy, buy a ticket. This year's budget request packet is a bit larger than previous years for three reasons. The first one, uh, there was confusion during last year's uh, town meeting, and so we wanted to clarify any misunderstandings about the library's budget. Um, our budget is a little complicated because we rely on many different uh, sources of income, and we pay our bills through both the town's accounting department and our own corporation. Number two, more and more, we are seeing more new faces on many of the town's budget process committees, such as BCG, JCPC, and finance. And because Massachusetts public libraries have to follow so many different laws and regulations, which most normal people are unfamiliar with, uh, we wanted to give an overview of the complexity of the library state aid requirements. And number three, health insurance increases, combined with the increases to minimum wage, which is a great thing, um, have put the library in a really tough spot. So the additional information in this packet is just help, uh, to help you see the larger library picture. So within a, in the packet, uh, you're gonna see our income trends, and since FY13, our reliance on the endowment draw rate has decreased by 24%. And this is uh, smart financial planning. And our reliance on fundraising and the SAMIs has increased by 81%. Our expense trends from FY14 through FY17, salaries have increased 7.5% in total. Operations have increased 9.2% in total, and our utilities expenses have decreased by 15%. So we're happy about all of those things. Uh, a breakdown of our donations. We would be lost without our donors and the Friends of the Jones Library system. I genuinely wish that I could include hugs in all of my thank you letters to the donors. All of our donations go towards materials and programming. It's, it's not going to pay the utilities. Last year, 676 people from 61 different towns donated over $81,000 to the library, and 45 different businesses donated over $14,000, and we're really very thankful and happy about this. And then there's our endowment. In FY09, the economy was scary for all of us. At that time, our endowment was at $6,024,657. That was as of March 31st in 09. As of February 28th of this year, the value is back up to $8,089,645. Yay! Uh, you'll see in the packets that an FY10 was when our Woodbury donation came in. 
Uh, and then in FY11, we, the trustees separated out the Woodbury front from the rest of uh, the endowment. And then in FY15 and 16, after a lot of research, the trustees switched to passive management of the endowment uh, in order to save on uh, those man management fees. The trustees work really well together, and because of their investment experience, they're doing an excellent job of overseeing the endowment. So what I want to focus on in your packets are pages 24 and 25, which is the library's budget summary. So starting on page 24, that's the format that the library and most other town departments use, have used historically, <coughs> where expenses equal revenue. Uh, it's, this is the document that will go to town meeting for approval. So in above, in the above portion, it's showing for FY19, $2,683,069 worth of expenses. And below, it's showing which accounts we're going to use to pay for those $2.6 million worth of expenses. I have also added this year an FY18 adjusted budget column uh, for two reasons. So mid-year, uh, the trustees and I, we were able to increase our part-time employees from level three to level four uh, to better reflect their work skills and responsibilities. Uh, also mid-year, we were notified of an increase to our benefits expense line uh, for health insurance. Uh, so I really wanted the percentage change uh, column to be more accurate, which is why I put in that adjusted column. So under FY19 budget expenses for salaries, we're showing a 3.5% increase. Benefits is a 23% increase. Materials is showing a 2.82% decrease, and the reason is uh, it, it's a formula, so the more money we spend on benefits, the less money we have to spend on circulating materials. Um, we are also, for FY19, going to, be, going to be cutting programming in half, so we can help fund the health insurance increases. Uh, down below under FY19, the income, we're showing the 3.5% increase to town appropriation, which is what you all had recommended. Uh, the 5% endowment draw rate. We are budgeting for a 31% increase to gifts, annual fund, and SAMIs, and a 42% decrease to state aid because as of this year, all our state aid reserves will be spent. Also under positions down at the bottom of this chart, you'll see uh, in order to help balance the budget, there are three part-time positions that we won't be filling. Now, if you flip over to page 25. So the only difference between pages 24 and 25 is the actual income. So in the row titled, kind of two thirds down, uh, where it says surplus and deficit and it's in green and red, as you go across uh, the page. In FY13, you'll see that we ran with a $1,245 deficit. We relied on state aid reserves from previous years to fill that gap. So at that time, our state aid reserves were pretty high. In FY14, that was the first year that the, the trustees dropped the endow endowment draw rate from 5.4% to 5%, and their goal was to hit 4% in three years. So in FY14, the deficit increased uh, to almost $23,000, again, with state aid reserves used to fill the gap. In FY15, the draw rate decreased again to 4.5%, so the deficit increased to 56.5. In FY16, the draw rate hit rock bottom, yay, the 4%, and so that gave us a deficit that year of 86,000, almost $87,000. Uh, again, with state aid reserves being able to cover that deficit with no problem. In FY17, we maintained that 4% draw rate and the deficit decreased a little bit to 72,000, 72, 670. And then in FY18, this fiscal year, we were able to maintain a 4% draw rate and we're projecting about a 67, $68,000 deficit. So the, the good point that I wanna make about this is the deficit or the gaps that we've, uh, that we've had going over these past few years has, have really been quite fine. And if it weren't for the health insurance issues, we could have continued on this path. Because we have been able to use prior year's state aid to fill the current year's budget gap, it, it's better than taking additional money out of the endowment when it's, the, the money that sits in state aid is not earning any interest whatsoever. So, um, 
Yeah, so that's why what the trustees did has made complete sense. Um, the trustees have used as little of the endowment as possible so that the principal could continue to grow. But because of the astronomical increases to health insurance, our good times have temporarily come to an end, and we don't have any more state aid to fill the gap. So the final point, this is all leading to this. The town's appropriation to the library has not kept up with health insurance and minimum wage increases. The recent increases to minimum wage have greatly affected the library's budget. Out of our 57 employees, half of them are just above minimum wage. And once the minimum wage increases to $15 an hour, it will affect all of the library positions as well, all the library union positions as well, which make up almost the rest of the staff. I imagine that the entire SEIU wage chart will probably be affected and will have to be upgraded. Also, from FY14 to FY19, the library's personnel and benefits expenses have risen 22%. That's with a few retirements of long-standing, long-term um, staff members with high longevity um, as, and no increases to staffing. So they've gone up 22%, but we're not, we're not adding more staff. But during that same time period, the town's appropriation to the library has only increased 14.4%. So based on what little I know about the historical relationship between the town and the library, I understand that the town's appropriation to the library has always been just considered, here's a lump sum appropriation, and that increases to the library's town appropriation was never meant to cover rising costs of personnel or health care. Instead, those increases that we got, they were just lumps. The town's appropriation has never covered 100% of the library's personnel costs. Every year we turn over to the town an additional 40, 50, or $60,000 to cover personnel and benefits. And that's been totally fine and reasonable as long as we can cover operations costs. The Jones Library is very much a town department. Library employees are town employees. Library maintenance and capital is town maintenance and maintenance and capital, and the only difference is that the trustees determine how the library money is spent rather than the select board. So what are our options? We could spend down the endowment, but that will just leave the town having to fully fund us at some point. Or we could try to mitigate the long-term cost to the town by preserving the endowment. Going much above the 5% draw rate threatens the long-term viability of the endowment. There are additional cuts we could institute. We have already hit all of the low-hanging fruit, and even the not-so-low-hanging fruit. We have cut programming, materials, office supplies, maintenance, staff development, personnel. There's really nothing left to cut without hurting a lot. We could lay off staff. We could further cut night and weekend hours. We could eliminate more programming, buy fewer books, close the branches, or some combination thereof. But all of these items could lead to decertification, and based on what we've all seen regarding the town's love of library services, there doesn't seem to be much of an appetite for these extreme cuts. Fundraising. So I'd love to be able to raise an additional $36,000 next year on top of the 116 that we're all good, already going to be raising, but this is a very ambitious goal. If we do not attain this goal, some very hard choices will have to be made. So this leaves the town appropriation. We are committed to working with and through BCG. I believe that within the next couple of years, the town should consider funding a larger portion of the library's personnel costs. But to be clear, we're not looking to sit on mountains of reserve funds. We're not looking to increase services. We're not looking to add open hours, additional staff. We just don't want to further reduce library services. Without an increase in what the town provides, we may be forced to do so. That's it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Are there, are there questions for the library director? I'll start with one. You're talking about sort of the number of options you have, you know, as far as reducing the sort of expense side of your, of your ledger. Um, have you and the and the um, trustees had conversations about how you might prioritize those or how you're thinking about those? Um, not to say that, well, you know, because the town doesn't really necessarily have a lot of resources to sort of give to you in some respects. I mean, it's, it's going to be a combination at best to, to, to sort of 
uh, get to where we all need to be. So I'm just sort of curious about what your process is at this point as far as thinking about those and how do you evaluate the different options that you have and, and sort of where you are at this point as far as making evaluations and determinations. Great question, thank you. Um, yeah, so this year was really hard for the trustees and the staff um, because we knew there was gonna be a huge budget gap for FY19, and we're still not out of the woods quite yet for FY18. Um, so there were, there were a lot of meetings between me and the library department heads and me and the trustees doing just that, prioritizing. And our, our number one goal is to not be decertified because I, that's kind of like, that would be the end of the world for the library. We don't want to be a standalone library. So we played around with um, <clears throat> what items we could cut that would not affect uh, certification. So for example, programming, that, that's the biggest thing. Um, the Friends fund the vast majority of our programming, um, but we do not have to have programs in order to be certified. On the flip side of that is our programming numbers are through the roof, people love it, are asking for more, and so that's one of the things that will hit the public the most. So th that's another aspect of our, our decision making is what will hurt the public the, le the least amount. Um, so programming would hurt the most, but it doesn't affect certification. Open hours, uh, we could close earlier on Tuesdays and Thursday nights without affecting uh, certification, but there are a lot of people who's there, the only time they can get to the library is on nights and weekends. So, um, so that's painful. Um, hours at the branches, that, that was all analyzed. We could reduce those hours, but as you guys have seen, this town loves the branches. Um, so that would hurt the, uh, that would hurt the public. Um, programming, materials, expenditures, fundraising, uh, da 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 da, closing that, cutting. And then, and, and then it comes down to the layoff. So really those are the, those are the remaining, that's the remaining low hanging fruit that doesn't affect certification. Um, the next big junk, jump is staff. If, if you wanna close a $36,000 budget gap, you're really talking about staff. Um, and we have had discussions. I have lots of spread charts and, sh and, and sheets of paper and things like that. So we've been thinking about it. So regarding the certification, what are the component pieces? You don't have to go into the gory detail of it, but sort of what are the sort of primary things that the, uh, the Mass Library Board's looking at for you to maintain your certification? What are the sort of critical factors for yeah. them? Um, so one of the biggies is the um, Municipal Appropriation Requirement, the MAR, which the town meets. Um, I don't have that figure in front of me because the town meets it. Uh, we have to spend a certain amount of money on circulating materials. And uh, for us, for next year, that figure is... That's the $207,000 mark, um, which we're budgeting for. Uh, we have to be open a certain number of hours, and that is where we have wiggle room. We are open 64 hours a week, and I think uh, in order to be certified, we have to be open at least 59. So, so there's, that's one of the reasons that we were looking at open hours. Um, those are the biggies. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Wall. Thank you very much for that detailed presentation. I really appreciate the way you've tried to lay out what you've been cutting here and why it's helpful to have that, that level of detail. Just one historical footnote. Uh, there was a case for the library actually faced decertification about, geez, something like 10 years ago. Uh, this was when the economic downturn took place and the town had to cut budgets across the, across the board. And that included the library budget, which would have brought you into decertification. I mean, not you, you weren't here, but the library into decertification. And <clears throat> this was an equal cut that everyone suffered. And a few members of the library trustees, let us say, were not team players and tried to do some underhanded things back then. But I remember at the same time, I had a conversation with the head of the, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, and he made the point that the decertification is basically a matter of honor or pride, but it doesn't have practical consequences in 
the short run at least. For decertification? Yes, as he presented it. No, it, it actually He said does. it happens on more occasions than you would think. Uh, Not that we want to get there, but it's just, I think there's a, a danger of over-dramatizing over perhaps what the consequences of decertification are for, for um, the public. So, so there's two, what, so decertification, I feel like is, is genuinely the, the end of the world. It would mean your Jones Library Amherst card is only good in Amherst. It won't be good anywhere else. You won't be able to use interlibrary loan. You won't be able to have access to the databases. So it turns us into a standalone library. But where the MBLC comes into play is what they say is, you are, towns are absolutely allowed to cut the library as long as all the other town departments are cut equally. Um, so I'm hoping that's what it meant, yeah. Screw So I have it's kind of more a thought. It's not so specific. It's more general. But um, I've often thought about the situation we have, where the we have library trustees who are in charge of the library and the library building, the Jones Library. That building is owned by the trustees or by the library, and then the town supports the library operation and some of the capital and repair of the building. And so um, as much as I appreciate and in, in, um, sort of honor you being the cheerleader for all things library, the, the town has, every, every time we spend money on something that's really great and worthwhile, it potentially takes money away from something else great and worthwhile in, in a different part of the ledger. So if the, so when I'm, I'm wondering like if the trustees are making the decisions and, and spending priorities for the library, and I'm sure they're doing a great job. How do we enter in that conversation since we're the, we, the town as a whole, is sort of managing the budget? So it's great to say, well, the town should up its appropriation because we don't want to lose all these things that people really value, but how do, how do we have a, a conversation that looks at all of that in, in some way, because I, I mean, I understand the autonomy there, but then but when the, it doesn't work out, you come over to this side of the ledger and how do, how do we so decide what from the priorities my, are? From my perspective, uh, this is what makes BCG so great. So I've worked in seven other municipalities and genuinely there is no other town as amazing as this town because the budget process starts in September and it does not end until June. There are constant conversations. So I, you know, I meet monthly with Paul. I'm constantly meeting with the trustees. We meet with uh, BCG starting in October. October. I, I feel like there's constant discussion. I don't know what this change, uh, charter process will change will bring, um, but there will obviously be changes there. And I, coming back to, you mentioned autonomy, and I, I just don't think that we have that. Without the town, we're nothing. We can't run the library with 4% on the endowment. The, the, the endowment just well, isn't I, large I enough. I, I mean, decision making. I, I, I totally get it. And so it's it's similar to the schools you know you have a school committee that's separate and they do but I don't believe it doesn't happen that way in Amherst though uh, so legally the trustees have authority over how the money is spent but just the relationship that we have here is spectacular and I don't expect that to change anytime soon so I th I believe the trustees are genuinely you know I put this speech together with their help and the trustees are they're not looking to storm the castle that's not what we're doing here and that's why I wanted to make it very clear that we're not looking to sit on all of our state aid and you guys just and the rest of the town you know be in pain because like you said the bottom line is what it is. And if you give us more money, it means somebody else gets less. We totally get that. We, we are looking for a conversation, that's all it is, to find that happy medium so that we can stick to that between four and 5% endowment draw. So that's it. Thank you for your comments. Can you say something? Yes. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, the library is a gem. It's, you know, as you've been in other towns, you, uh, you know there aren't many libraries that are like the Jones Library and the services that we provide, not just to the town of Amherst, but also to the region. Uh, we are a regional library. And that's not unusual for our services in the town of Amherst, um, but it comes at a cost because we have a lot of, uh, we serve a broader region. The, um, 
library, as you described it, is truly a complicated animal. The town and the library are intertwined at multiple levels. You don't control your health insurance budget, but you control other things. And you know, I think the relationship has been pretty strong between the town and the libraries. And I think there's been an attempt to treat all the different departments, schools, libraries, town departments, pretty equally. That you know, if everything's going up two percent, everything's going up two percent. Your trustees have different hats on. They they look at it from what's in the best interest of the library, which is a unique situation. And you have eight million dollars in the bank that you can look at, whereas other departments don't have that as a as a cushion. So it it's just a, it's a complicated conversation. I think the town does a really excellent job of having that conversation, as you mentioned several times, the BCG, where all the relevant boards get together and have those conversations on a regular basis. Um, it's really. Uh, Almost every department would come in and say, we need more money from the town, and the town doesn't have a limitless um, pot of money. It's what we have, and we share all the information pretty clearly and transparently. And if there's a different way to do it, I think we're always, everybody's interested in hearing it. We're all conflicted on this because we want services, we have rising costs, we have limited funds, and it's a conversation we have pretty much daily. And we, Ten, you know, an hour ago, Sonia was up. We were talking about what do we do about this, that, and the other thing. We're figure, trying to figure it out. So, I mean, I've always liked, you know, you always bring great passion, and the trustees are really, really good advocates for the library. Um, and I think what's the important thing is that we're all working together as a team on this entire thing. Other questions for the director? If not, Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming in and, and sharing your budget with us in, in detail and uh, painting a picture of where we're at and where we're headed. <laughs> so next on our agenda is the, um, the request for letter of support slash non-opposition relative to medical marijuana. Uh, the Herbology Group in Incorporated, 422 Amity Street. So if you folks will come to the microphone, feel free to gather around. Additional materials? That we we do have a number of additional materials, I think, on our desk tonight. tonight. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think we, it's this one that says 4C, I think. A pretty substantial packet of multiple pages. Oh, it's in our packet. Yeah, it's, I thought there was some also have one letter, I think, that's separate. That, Oh, that came today. There was a cover letter. Did that get printed? It listed mm -hmm. a single or page that was. That's it. Yeah, this is here, right? This is. Yeah, I think that's it. That's that one. was today. <clears throat> one page on the desk. Yeah, it's the second page of this big packet, I believe. I that's last, the last desk, week's letter. Oh, did it change? It did change. Oh, just a hard copy. That's. No, there's, there are two letters. Oh. One date of April 4th and one date of April 7th. April 7th, I'm gonna, yeah. yeah. So that was on your desk tonight and on your desk. Correct. Is a status report on all the all four. Right. Uh, okay. Medical marijuana. So we'll need just a moment to find these loose sheets okay, of so paper I, that we just I got. So the status report was on my desk, and I'm having trouble finding the one page. There's a letter from Herbology dated April right. 7th. Yeah. Saw it, and then it flew away. Right. All right. It's fine. And then there's this one. Okay, that's it. So we had a, just two extra sheets beside the packet know, materials, I right? So we'll, once we get caught up. Oh, got it. You got it? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I think. Unless you or Mr. Kravitz are going to introduce them, then I'll, or introduce anything. If not, I'll have them just introduce yourselves uh, and tell us about uh, our knowledge group. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Frank Perullo, and I represent the Herbology Group. Let me introduce Jane Hammond, the CEO, and Anna Gray, the COO. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. I'm Jane Hammond. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Herbology Group. We are a minority-owned, women-owned, and veteran-owned business. It's our passion to enhance the quality of life of so many living in pain, which is the foundation of our nonprofit group. 
In addition to serving as the president and CEO of Herbology, I currently work in information technology as a quality assurance analyst for the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. I've served in the Air Force as a jet engine mechanic, and I have extensive background in the healthcare sector, uh, specializing in non-pharmaceutical management of pain, sports injuries, detox, addiction, and women's health. Um, I'm a graduate of the MedGro program, which is a trade school specific to the medical marijuana industry, and we are eager to work with the town of Amherst as a trusted community partner. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Anna Gray, and I'm the chief communications officer of Herbology Group, which just means that I like to talk the most out of everybody. Um, and uh, in addition to being the CCO of Herbology Group, I have worked 15 years in the public and private uh, health sector with the geriatric community as well as uh, the veterans uh, with veterans at the VA hospital. There I was the Hispanic emphasis uh, pro em the, Span the Hispanic employment special emphasis program manager where I did a lot of community outreach programs and I was also a big sister for the big brother big sister program um, and I was also a veteran in the uh, I'm also a veteran of the Air Force that's where I met Jane her and I were jet engine mechanics together yeah. and we really appreciate you guys having us here today. Thank you very much. Um, before I get into the presentation, I would like to um, address uh, the fact that we're going for a medical uh, license as well as a recreational license. And I think um, tonight we're here to address the medical side of it, which requires us to be in front of you for a letter of non-opposition of support. Um, the recreational side does not require that. It does require us to enter into a host community agreement with uh, the town. Uh, which we, uh, you know, I'd love to talk about uh, after. Um, we are holding a community meeting the, this week on Wednesday evening. Um, that was noticed um, in the local paper. It was also mailed and certified. I do want to note, I, I did hear a conversation that happened at the last meeting um, where I think it was felt that it might have been uh, rushed. Um, while we did meet the requirements, I would uh, also offer that we will be holding another open house um, in about four weeks. Uh, we will do the same noticing, same ads. Um, w you know, frankly, we like to talk about this. We have no uh, issues uh, being as transparent as possible, so we will be holding that other meeting. Um, and we'll be going down the licensing of both uh, medical and recreational in parallel. The state has this bifurcated process for now. It will come together at some point, but for now, we are going through both. A, a lot of people have asked why do both, just recreational. Medical is at the core of what we offer. Um, um, so we're gonna continue doing both at, at great expense to uh, the herbology group. Um, if there's any questions specifically on that, can I take them now or do you wanna? <coughs> No, I just have one request, and that is sure. if you show um, diagrams of the building, which sure. you did in your prior, could you show us how the two aspects of the business fit together in the same building sure. um, as you go to that point? Yeah, I'll do that tonight, actually, as we go through the, the presentation, Thank for you. sure. Um, <clears throat> so, again, another point where I think we will be uh, maybe changing this. Herbology Group is a nonprofit corporation. We are not, um, we're not forced to be a nonprofit under the Recreational Act. We will be doing a conversion to a for-profit entity. That'll be over the coming months and with Department of Public Health, uh, Health's approval along with the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, but for now and for the foreseeable future, we are a, a licensed nonprofit. Now this property is uh, owned by our management team and we'll be paying all property taxes on the property. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move forward to the team. Um, you met Jane. You met Anna. We also have Brad Baker, who uh, unfortunately could not be here. He had uh, a child uh, two days ago. Uh, congratulations, Brad. And uh, Adam Fine from Vicente Cedarburg is our legal compliance. Uh, and April Hammond also could not be here as well. But a very uh, well-rounded team. Uh, Brad is a security consultant with FTG Technologies. They are uh, actually the security consultant to the Cannabis Control Commission as well. Um, and Adam uh, Fine is, you know, always talked about in uh, legal circles as the preeminent uh, cannabis attorney in the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Second here about our management team. We are uh, in partnership with a management team, Sea Hunter Therapeutics. 
um, Scantra Therapeutics is a management team that offers capital, intellectual prop, uh, property, and operational expertise. They have uh, relocated a team of experts from around the country to Massachusetts to help uh, operate our facilities. Um, and that includes packaging, extraction, cultivation, and uh, their real estate acquisitions as well. Our proposed site, I think this site is familiar uh, to you. Um, having appeared, um, another operator having appeared before you for a letter quite some time ago. 422 Amity Street, it's a standalone building, ideally suited for security and patient access. There are dozens of parking spots, probably between 30 and 40 in our uh, immediate area, as well as a shared parking lot um, uh, adjacent. We have front uh, ADA entrance and a secure back entrance for standalone for staff and deliveries. We meet all local and state regulations. The current site, as it is now, and a rendering of what it will look like. Um, we, our signage is, again, state regulation. We're not allowed to uh, advertise. We're not allowed to have anything but the license holder's name uh, out front. <clears throat> Interior floor plan is included here. Um, you will notice that um, to your, if you're looking at either screen, to your right hand side is a uh, front entrance with a vestibule. Um, so it's a, a secure door with a trap, meaning you can't get in uh, to the dispensary floor without showing your ID to one of the security individuals. Uh, once you're passed through there and the front door, the front door uh, to the exterior is locked, you are allowed into the dispensary floor. Uh, where there are uh, POS terminals and patient access. Um, now, when it comes to recreational, the state has uh, allowed the use of temporary, um, hard to say, uh, temporary either ropes and chains as well as sort of a privacy curtain, something like you would see at a CVS or a Walgreens where you go and have your uh, conversation with your pharmacist. So they're allowing one POS terminal or two, whatever you'd like, to stand as the medical terminal um, and the recreational or adult use will be at others. We plan on having um, two to three uh, for medical, so either one of the counters um, that you see on either the far left or the right um, for medical only, uh, which again will offer the types of privacy um, that the patients require. There'll also be a consultation room um, that uh, we're working into that plan because I think we, we do want a private consultation room. Oh, sure. Well, thank you very much. Just hit the green button there? Yeah. Um, so right here is where we're thinking for medical. And here for recreational sales. <clears throat> Security is here. Trap for exit is here, one door. These doors cannot open without this door here being closed. <clears throat> uh, again, worth noting since this location was in front of you before uh, with Happy Valley Ventures, the site plan that they had drawn up had two, uh, it was a, they were trying to do a development. Um, so two buildings on the parcel. We are standing, uh, we are just redoing the existing building on the site uh, to maintain the uh, existing parking. We'll be restriping the lot and working on some of the exterior, but uh, other than that, um, the site will remain fairly unchanged. <clears throat> the dispensary will be open between the hours of eight and eight. Um, the average patient, patient visit uh, is around 10 minutes, although that lowers once you're in operation um, to four to six, depending on um, how long you're open and is it, whether it's their first time. Um, we will adhere to strict access protocols, and we will not be, as long as we're medical only, uh, again, this was for a medical presentation, we will not uh, allow anyone but patients in the door. <clears throat> uh, we did uh, 
We did perform a traffic study by Hayes Engineering that I believe we have sent to you, right, correct, yes. And um, that has, uh, has no traffic impacts. Uh, this, this dispensary will have none. The dispensary will be monitored uh, by a live security firm. The cameras will uh, be placed on the exterior um, of the site in coordination with your local law enforcement. You will have, your local law enforcement will have access to those camera feeds live as they uh, see fit, and the interior feeds are uh, made available to them when they feel the need to have them or when DPH requests them or the Cannabis Control Commission at the time that they take over. Uh, products are all um, stored in vaults under video surveillance. They are delivered at random times, two or three times a week, again, under video surveillance, and they are delivered to the store uh, individually packaged, not in bulk. Um, patients will be absolutely educated on their first visit to the site, and they are absolutely not prohibited to use any products anywhere near the site. So we do anticipate um, signing a host community agreement with the town. Um, there is, uh, a, a, this is another instance where we're sort of, you know, there's two different ways we could do this. We would love to sign one agreement that covers us for recreational or adult use and medical, um, or we could negotiate one for medical now and, and one for host, uh, for recreational later. Uh, but either way, there is a local option tax that you all, I believe, have accepted, and then the uh, additional 3% that goes towards uh, the town. We will be hiring 25, uh, 20 to 25 is what I should say, full-time, uh, well-paying jobs. These include benefits and 401k programs. Um, we have already uh, started the community outreach program with our open house this Wednesday. We'll uh, perform another open house within four weeks, and we are also uh, committing to uh, a walk of our neighbors, uh, a business walk, any neighbor that's within uh, probably a quarter mile or more. We have to go expansive on one side um, as the rest of it is uh, not inhabited, inhabited. So we will be absolutely reaching out to all the neighbors to let them know that what, what our plans and our, our intentions are for the project. And at this point, I think I can turn it over to questions. All right, so I know I have a few questions. I don't know if my colleagues also have questions. Yeah, but why don't you go first? So I have a couple of, I'm hoping fairly straightforward questions around some of the, um, so first off, the, the entrance will be, um, the medical and, and, and adult use will not be segregated as far as entrance is concerned at this point, correct? No. And so you'll triage that once people come in? Yes, exactly. So state law doesn't require us to have separate rooms. In other states, there actually is a requirement for separate rooms, in Colorado, for instance. Um, but Massachusetts just wants there to be privacy for the patients, um, which means we can set up. Uh, and, and, and frankly, that hasn't been sort of, you know, the regulations are in draft form. Uh, they're out, but they're not full yet. Um, so they've released them, but there's still work to be done on that. So the other, the other question I have is, is um relative to some of the video feeds and, and making things available to local law enforcement. Um, and the particular question I have is, is related to um, those secure vaults and the video feeds of those, which are interior to your building. You indicated in, in, your, in your documentation here that the exterior would be available to the police. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that that part, which is, you know, under is your, in your control only, as far as uh, patients aren't going back there, uh, uh, consumers aren't going back there, that that also would be a video feed you'd make available to us. Um, just because, again, although it's interior of the building, we have to be sensitive to patient uh, confidentiality and that sort of thing, um, uh, that, that, that our local law enforcement would be uh, available to, to see that video as well, or, or it could be set up in such a way that that could be the case. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think what I'm uh, meaning to say is that the uh, exterior views, I believe they can get on an as-needed basis. In the interior, they just have to request. Um, uh, whatever state regulation is, we will absolutely abide by, and, and they have access to that, uh, I believe, whenever they want, whenever they wish to see that, okay. for sure. And they will have uh, foot patrol in the exterior building, I believe, correct? Um, so we will have foot patrol. Um, we'll have tw uh, security when we are open, and they will do um, sweeps 
um, of the building to ensure that patients aren't using the uh, medicine outside the building, for sure, yes. Okay. Um, the other question I would ask, just broadly, um, have you reached out to the manager, maybe the manager can answer this one, um, relative to the host community agreement, have you started that conversation yet? Or, and if so, any progress being made? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we spoke briefly about the host community agree agreement in general at our, our last meeting. I think we wanted to get here and we're happy to have that conversation as soon as he, uh, he's able to, for sure. I have a long list, so maybe my colleagues <laughs> I think you better go ahead, because you may so, throw questions um, at us. I was a little surprised when you said the regulations microphone. weren't final. Cutting. Well, the mic. Okay. I, I, because I they add. are, they haven't been signed by the Secretary of State, the regulations but they're, around they're not the going to change. No, oh. the regulations are around the privacy screening. What okay. they said was you can have sort of stanchions, right. but they haven't told us exactly what they're looking for by that. Okay. So the regulations sure are out, but that part is, um, they may, make mention, I believe, um, separate area. Okay. That's it. So actually one of my questions was since I, I believe you and you say um, that you're very concerned about the medical aspect of mm. this business, but I was surprised in that case that you hadn't done more in your design to create the separate facility, although it may meet the minimum requirement with the screening and the mm -hmm. curtain, but as we know, that doesn't really give you so sound separation, and some of the models I've seen will have separate areas for medical and for recreational. I don't. My, I, I totally understand that a medical facility would also have recreational because I think that's where the bulk of the volume activity is. So sure. that's, that's not the problem. But given how seriously you are committed to medical, I mm -hmm. was surprised to see one <clears throat> well, sales room. Let me, let me, I should clarify. This is our medical room. That's how we designed this. this these plans were sent and presented to, uh, I think, Jeff and months ago, three or four months ago, before the implementation of the recreational law. So our plan is now to go back to the drawing board and just add, like I mentioned, a room, a consultation room, um, as well as some enhanced privacy for the patients. So you might, especially with some encouragement from the town, yes. redesign. I, I get these these plans. Oh work. yeah, these are. You could conceptual. redesign to have that. Oh, a hundred percent separation. Yes in the sales as well as the consultation. So that was just one Yes, and that's a fair point. I had. That, that's a fair point. It's a fair uh, point. We consider it recreational use, we consider it adult use, so we believe if you are a patient of ours or coming to our facility, you're coming to poor. Yeah. Well, I, I understand, but if someone's coming in as an adult user and I'm coming in with a particular medical need, I may not want anyone to hear about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a point well taken, and again, it's, it's the, the plans are strictly medical. Okay. We now have to pivot. Okay. So that's just some feedback on, Fair on my view. Um, I was really interested when I read the traffic study um, that is for a restaurant. So I'm guessing there aren't really any comparables around by our traffic, this traffic engineer that mm -hmm. looked at this. But when I'm thinking of full service eating establishment and the turnover time, they don't, I'm not suggesting there is a traffic problem, but I, I found this kind of amusing because it wasn't a standard that totally made sense to me. So that, yeah. that's just. Uh, it's a traffic study for medical, which again would be different than recreational. Okay, so then we're just for yes. our record, yep. establish that some of this isn't really applicable as you've changed your plan. So that's. It, exactly. And it, many plans have changed because we now have the adult use yes. regulations. And so yep. I don't have any problem with the co locating, but. This may be not so germane to the discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm only have, I think, two more questions. So mm -hmm. this is the first um, application we've seen that had a woman-owned and a minority-owned um, operator. And I commend you for that because um, the State Cannabis Control Commission and I think our town also want to make sure that this business is accessible for a variety of people. And so um, I think the, we're, we're seeing that diversity with you being here. And so that's, I want to um, commend you for that. Um, but I'm wondering, um, since we're looking at a number of applicants, how would 
this add to what is being provided to residents of Amherst and the region? So if there's already a couple of other um, operators in the pipeline, what do you bring to this that's different or an additional value or um, service that would give our board a reason to want to have yet another adult use We in strongly believe now. in the free enterprise market and we're advocates and comfortable with creating that competition here. Um, and you know, we want to bring morality, equality, and compassion to this industry, and we really believe as parents and minorities and women veterans, we can really, uh, you know, connect with, the connect with the community more than some of the other dispensaries that are going to be coming here. And also, after speaking with the, uh, after hearing her with, you know, about the library, the money that's going to come in, we're no longer going to have to have these conversations about deficits, you know, and underfunded programs, but we're actually going to be able to talk about funding these programs, especially programs that help people get away from real addictions, what we consider. And so we're super excited about that. And also C Thunder Therapeutics has a great product line, a high quality product line with lots of medical research. And they, we, we think that we're going to offer the most um, variety of non-euphoric cannabis products and CBD products because we feel there's a lack of that right now in the industry. A lot of people switch to recreation or adult use and then mm -hmm. they don't offer that. And, yeah, they forget about the, the medical veteran. side and we're really passionate about that. So I know in, in the regulations, the state's requiring 35% of the product to be set aside. Could you just, for people who here who might not know or viewers, um, if you could answer the, what you mean when you say non-euphoric. Non-euphoric cannabis is um, cannabis, which is a CBD form, without the THC, which is the form that tends to get you high, you know, and, you know, there will be different levels of that too within the products, uh, lower levels of THC, and there's different forms of the products and different strains that can, um, like indicas and sativas that will help people more with pain or um, more, you know, insomnia. So there's different forms of cannabis, but yeah, one of our main focuses is definitely providing some non-euphoric options, cannabis through transdermal patches, you know, slobs, um, pills, mm -hmm. you know, also there is an, uh, the opportunity for children that um, have debilitating conditions to also take this. We want to make sure that you know, we can provide a product f for them too. We feel like there's definitely a, a lack of that. Yeah, we yeah. strongly believe this to be a public safety and health issue and with the regulation and with good policy, we can really benefit the community. I also think it's worth noting that um, Herbology Group is citing three dispensaries all in Western Mass. Uh, they're making a commitment, uh, you know, uh, West and m moving here and moving their families here uh, and creating the jobs uh, in this region. Did you mention the three communities? Sure, East Hampton, Greenfield, and Amherst. So to follow on your, your um, medical marijuana uh, and, and your um, commitment to that, um, can you talk a little bit about your staffing? You sort of mentioned in general how many jobs would be involved. Uh, you know, are you expecting to have a pharmacist uh, on duty? Sort of what do you see as far as your sort of medical director or pharmacist or sort of what is your uh, current vision of what you think the staff would look like at the facility and sort of when those folks would be there relative to the total hours you're open, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, the site is large enough to hold a couple executive offices. Um, for here, we are considering our security and our extractions uh, head. Um, the ext so when we talk about extractions, that's actually what we're, we're talking about necessarily the, the way to get medicine properly. Um, Centra Therapeutics and along with Herbology have made a commitment to uh, no added fillers, distillates, and hydrocarbons. So this is a, a product that is 100% pure. Uh, cannabis. Um, this is the safest, most effective way to uh, deliver medicine, and that extraction chief will be uh, on site here. Um, also, our head of security for Herbology Group will also be here on site. Um, unclear on how many offices we can get based on, again, the drawings, um, but we do, do think two to three C-level staff uh, will be here on site uh, for sure. Um, sea Hunter Therapeutics has um, a uh, medical program overseen by, uh, it's not a doctor, but it's someone who has long extensive history studying cannabinoids, and um, their product lines and medical efficacy is, uh, I think it's the highest in the industry. Um, and 
uh, we'll be cultivating out of East Hampton, and um, that's where the cultivation um, expertise will be, to give you a little sense of where people will be located. Right. Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, um, several things. One is to pick up on the question Mr. Slaughter asked a moment ago, again, about pharmacists. Um, somebody who um, feels that they need and have been advised by a physician that they would benefit from uh, medical marijuana, but they've had no experience before. Um, back to the pharmacist question, who is on staff and what expertise uh, do you now have to assure that the person understands the options available to them and makes an appropriate determination? We're going to have a staff of trained um, bud tenders and uh, patient advocates, and they will be trained in uh, basically depending on what the doctor's prescription is and the, and and um, what they're to meet with the patient and review everything that if they have used before or if they're new to this and try to get an understanding of what's the best use for them and what's the safest use for them and also educate the patient how to safely store store the medicine and how often they would have to come back. And that goes back mm -hmm. to Hunter Therapeutics uh, management yeah. team, our management team. Yeah. That's where they bring in that operational expertise of people from Colorado mm -hmm. and all around the nation that have been in this industry for years that know and they're going to train our staff perfectly into helping patients get what they need, the exact strain and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that actually is a segue to what I was thinking is my next uh, um, area of inquiry, which is um, I, I gather from your location so that you've identified in the material you've provided that you are currently not a provider in any other states. This is a new business to you, and um, uh, which is a little different from some of the other companies that have come in before, so um, I was going to ask, and you started to answer the question a little bit about what, um, where you ha um, are turning to gain the expertise that um, an experienced operator who's been um, doing this in other jurisdictions um, was bringing to the table. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly why the Herbology Group reached out to Sientra Therapeutics for a partnership. Um, the medical and recreational bills both allow for uh, applicants, women, veteran, minority-owned businesses, but when they reach a certain point, they do need to reach out for expertise and capital, and that's what Herbology did. Uh, and they were successful in uh, creating a partnership with Sientra Therapeutics, who again moved uh, and re located over 20 C-level executives from Colorado and, and various uh, uh, places who've been running medical or recreational operations in the country. They are currently um, in operation in other states. I can get you that detailed information about where they operate um, and where they help manage uh, locations. Um, but that's exactly the partnership here. So we have uh, people who uh, are, are passionate about the product, who uh, come from a background uh, treating people with uh, serious pain and drug addiction, um, who reached out, found capital, found expertise to partner and, and create this type of uh, experience for patients. So you have a partner who has been an active operator in other jurisdictions, is what you're... Yeah, correct. Uh, and, and under the... Again, I'm, I'm going to stick to medical. Under the Medical <laughs> Act, uh, they're nonprofit entities, that the license holders, and that's Herbology Group. And then there's... there's Oftentimes, if not all the time, there's a management company, and that management company provides a lot of the expertise and, and or capital needed. Um, so that's exactly what we have here, is that we have a nonprofit uh, entity that holds the license, that's the herbology group in, before you, and a management company that services the license with them to provide that expertise. And as you've uh, consulted with them, um, what have they advised you as to the challenges of co-locating both an adult use and medical um, establishment within the same facility and uh, what lessons have you taken away into the operation of your three locations including the one in Amherst? 
Uh, maintaining medical, I think, is, is often a challenge. Um, Three percent of the population in mature markets uh, have medical patients. So Colorado, Oregon, the rule of thumb is three percent. And the recreational adult use market is much larger. So a, a lot of times um, the m medical market will, will go away or the medical, uh, the, the importance of medical um, doesn't exist anymore. And that's something that Sea Hunter has, again, a proven commitment making the best products, and we have a proven commitment. Uh, we will be proving in a commitment to making sure we always provide those products. Uh, I would guess that is one of the biggest challenge. And talking to regulators around the country, they, they tell you that the medical program oftentimes doesn't have a use when the, the patients can get uh, medicine that um, is available without registering with a government entity. Um, having to keep that registration up, I believe it's a small cost per year, but it is a cost per year. Um, and the dosage on medical is, is essentially what is, is different. Um, in Massachusetts, the law states that every uh, portion or every uh, whatever it is that they're doing can be five milligrams. Um, in medical, that is much higher. And people who are uh, dealing with severe pain, debilitating uh, diseases, they need large amounts uh, to manage those things. So the medical programs are absolutely ne necessary. Um, sometimes it's hard to make that economics work, um, but that's why I think a well-funded, experienced group with high medical efficacy products makes sense. That's why we're here. And I, we still think that a lot of those patients are medical patients that are adult. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Jane likes to speak on this. You can speak on this. Well, a lot of people don't want to go and get their medical. A, a lot of people do, do not want to get a medical car because they're registered in the system or social number and, and they would possibly get fired from their jobs. Mm -hmm. So they tend to go to the adult use market. But what's great about this state is medical, I think they're tax free, right? When yes. they come buy products, that's awesome. It's not like that in every state. So um, yeah, I think medical will stick around in Massachusetts for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I guess the last question I'll ask and then I think um, Ms. Ms. Krieger had a, had a follow up. She was, but I'll let her ask it directly. Uh, you mentioned the hours of operation projected as 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. I assume, since we're principally talking about the medical aspect, that that's what the um, um, reference was to. Generally, would you expect both um, parts of the business to operate on the same hours, or would you see it as um, there being possible differential there? Um, there, if, if the town so wanted it under a uh, condition of a special permit, we'd be happy to do that. I do think what, we, what we're trying to achieve is not be open too late, not be open too early, allow people before work and after work uh, get what they need. Um, so certainly open to changing those. I'm not sure, and, I, and I forgive me, I don't remember if you have specific instructions in your zoning ordinances for hours of operation. Some towns do. Uh, some cities do. I don't believe you do. So, so therefore, I, I think we chose 8 to 8 to be an hour before and a couple hours after work. But open to that discussion. In some communities, it's um, 9 to 7. Some, it's 9 to 8. We're, we're open to that discussion. I think that's something that we can uh, discuss during um, the special permit process. But the 8 to 8 was for medical? It applies for medical, for sure, okay. yes. Yeah. Very disparate. So I'm trying to figure out, and I know you introduced yourselves. Can you explain who you are in sure. relationship to the um, the, the group? herbology? Yes. So sure. um, I missed when you said like sure. what your position was, or I'm I'm just kind of missing that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> My name is um, Frank Perullo. I uh, run a company called the Novus Group, and we do public and community affairs and cannabis uh, consulting. Okay, so you're the consultant to I am. them. Correct. And you're answering most of the questions. Okay. So when I look at the good, I would that would be good. Um, uh, so on our team of experts, yes. I'm wondering. That's Jane's sister. That looks just like okay. Her. I very shy. So it's not your daughter. No. <laughs> and that's and, and you're very shy because you're the yeah. you're the ghost picture here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I had yeah, a headshot done. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, so you're the principals. He's yes. a consultant. Um, Okay, and then my other question is really different. So I'm looking at the rendering of the outside of the building, you know, and then you show rafters with a key owner. You know, it, it looks nice, but that building's pretty old, run down, and I'm wondering what level of improvement and capital you're gonna put into that building, um, given its age and condition, as an opportunity to improve. There is, there is enough area there to put other development or buildings, which in my mind is not a bad thing. 
you're in a key corner location in a really important part of town in a commercial area, you would have the closest proximity to the University of Massachusetts of any of the applicants that we've had under consideration. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you're going to do with that building. No, not, not yet. We don't have that with us. Um, our plan right now is to invest um, between five hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars within the building. Okay. So we're talking about a significant investment in infrastructure and the exterior and the interior. Uh, we're purchasing the building. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be around a three million dollar investment into the town. Um, that is enough for now in terms of w w what we can, uh, I think, make the economics work, along with you know host uh, community agreement payments, et cetera, before we get up and running. Um, in the future, would we be open to a development on the site? We probably would be, but at this point, we have enough in our hands just to take the building and, and make it up to the, uh, the standards that we, we wish. Okay. And uh, Mr. Slatter, I have a question for Mr. Bach Mr. Bachelman, or, or maybe for Mr. Kravitz. Um, we have issued a letter of support for the site to the prior owner. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this, but how do we manage logistically a request for a letter on a site where we already have issued a letter? So that was one of the questions um, that we had a conversation about. We would want them to, I would think the board was interested in having four letters of support or non-opposition out there versus adding a fifth. Uh, they were in discussions between Happy Valley, and which holds the current letter, um, and uh, Herbology. Do you want to talk about where the status sure. is of that? Sure. So we're, we received a letter and forwarded it to uh, Manager Bockelman. And what I can say is that it states um, they would be happy to rescind their request, um, but they want to make sure you know that they w may come back if this sale falls through, and they want to make sure they reserve the right not to just totally rescind it. It was sort of legal speak for yeah, we want you to be successful because we're making a sale to you, and that sale is completely contingent on you getting a letter for medical. But we want to make sure that we have the right, if your sale, if the sale falls through, to come back to the town. Uh, is that inaccurate? I think that was accurate. That, so, uh, is it, can we operate that way? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> that um, it's we a don't good know. question. I mean, it is something that you could choose to offer a, a letter and tell them that their letter is then voided. Again, our sale doesn't go through and is contingent upon that, is contingent upon us being successful. We've, we've never voided a letter, so. Right, right. understood. Yeah, to me. Yeah. Yes. There, you've raised a, a key issue and the relationship between Happy Valley. And why don't you, I think an important thing for you to talk about what is the relationship between you and Happy Valley, which has, which I believe still owns the site. Um, and so what, what's uh, going on with that? Fair question, great question. Uh, we have signed a purchase and sale agreement. Our purchase closing is contingent on receiving this letter and a special permit. Um, most cannabis sales of, of real estate are all contingent upon permitting, local permitting, not state. Most things are and that's where, it, yeah, exactly, most things in life are correct. Uh, so we are hoping to receive the letter, move on to special permit, and, and be successful and then close on the transaction. We have uh, paid a considerable amount thus far in either option or holding fees as well as um, the down payment and the, the purchase and sale agreement. So you said your product was gonna be produced in East Hampton. It is. And then you talk a lot about Sea Hunter Therapeutics and I Correct. guess I'd, it's important for, for our, the board to know what is the relationship between um, Herbology and mm -hmm. Sea Hunter, mm -hmm. and are they providing product, yes. or are they? And what is the exact relationship there? Yeah, so they're providing expertise, and um, the product is again. I'm going to speak just from medical. The medical market is vertically integrated, so we have to grow what we want to sell. Um, so we will be growing. They will be providing the cultivation expertise and the capital to build that cultivation facility, as well as the extraction uh, machinery and all the other things necessary to provide uh, the patients with what we need. Um, so that's where they come in with the, the capital and the expertise. And the ownership structure of Herbology, does Sea Hunter have any ownership stake in Herbology? No. Uh, Herbology Group is the 
license holder, nonprofit entity that will be, uh, I'm sure, converting to a for-profit entity. Um, the other question was if you are a, a cash-only business or if you'll be accepting payments by credit or debit cards. You want to handle that? Yeah. Well, right now we're a cash-only business. Oh, but, oh, but, but, but we have the but, central. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll add to that. Yeah. We are lucky enough to receive the um, a banking with Century Bank. And Century, Century Bank allows the debit cards. Yeah. Um, Century Bank has cut off all clients from now on. Um, at least that's what they're, they're telling people. Um, and so we are uh, set up with an account at Century, which means we will take debit cards. And they will be, if there is cash, they will be picking it up, again, random times throughout the week and uh, armed secure uh, vehicles. But we do think that the, um, the fact that we can take debit cards is a, is, is, is a, is a, great, a good thing. So to answer Ms. Kruger's question, how we manage the letter of non-opposition or support, if that's what, if you choose that you want to provide that, and how um, the contingent language uh, that Happy Valley is seeking because they have certain property rights that they want to respect as well, it's sort of like buying a house. It, all this stuff has to happen at the same time, I think. Um, but there are some legal contingencies that we, if you choose that you want to. Um, provide such a letter, we would start working on what that would look like. I think for me, just to, to that point, I think a little bit of a chicken and egg problem yeah. here. Uh, in, in some respects, I think for me, some confidence that we could create an arrangement mm -hmm. would be necessary to provide, a, to, to be fully confident in voting for a, a letter of support and non-opposition. There may be other there probably are going to be other factors for me as far as that's concerned, but that's certainly one of them. Um, and so I think we may need to have some uh, due diligence by yourself or Mr. Kravitz on, on that point or, or our town council to, to see what we could either include in that letter or what are the guarantees we could have. Because I think that um, we don't know what our options are as far as that's concerned and how much... Um, control we could exert and, and therefore what comfort level we have. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Sandberg. Yeah, I, um, I think we should uh, try and get that clarified, um, though I believe that uh, we would probably be restricted, and this is another question to ask um, through counsel or maybe Mr. Kravitz or Mr. Bachelman already know the answer that we couldn't issue two um, for the same location anyway, mm -hmm. so that um, a second one would almost have to be contingent upon the withdrawal of the first to be effective because of the um, distance requirements that are built into DPH regulations. Right. Correct. Mr. Wall? I think, I think we're all, I mean, thanks to my colleagues also for a lot of the, all the questions I would have asked in particular about oh, the facility. Oh, no. no. You should I mean, raise about your the, hand up. <laughs> no, no, but you're, you're the experts, the two of you, uh, about the facility. But just to, to clarify, so Happy Valley won't rescind the letter without a quid pro quo from us? Because they they're free to apply whenever they want. They can do whatever they, after they give up their letter, they can, they can always apply for something make, else. They can't make the sale without giving it. Right. Right. Um, I think they, they see the letter as an as a item of value to mm -hmm. them. And if this sale fails mm -hmm. for whatever reason, then they would not own. They would own a building without a letter support or support or non opposition from the but town. Is, so they are forward. hesitant to go forward with it. But um, that's a chicken egg thing again. Exactly. So. And I'm sure there's ways to think to work through this. Um, but I mean, Mr. Steinberg did hit the nail on the head when he said you can, we can't have right. two letters right. on the same location out. So um, how do we resolve that through town council or do have to talk persuasion? To council? Yeah. So if I may, I mean, would it be something that we could vote on contingent upon a conversation you have with town council? Therefore, at least the vote happens, and if the town council agrees with whatever approach you take, at least we can expedite the process? That's... Mr. Wall? I was just going to ask what the legal phrase for is contingent upon contingent upon contingent. <laughs> <laughs> this is like mirrors and mirrors after a while. Right. Right. It's, it's, yeah, sure. Uh, picture. 
You also could vote to withdraw the letter of support for the applicant that is selling us the property and authorize the letter for us all in one probably vote. Mm. Be your opinion. That would be, <laughs> that would be a very self-serving opinion. But I, I also do want to note that the, um, so, and Jeff, you may, uh, I, I guess I'm going to just give my opinion on this. From the year, when you get asked to the um, operating procedures, phase two of the process, you have, uh, and then you get, in, in, you, you get through that and you get to citing. Once you go to citing, you have one year to put your application in. Um, so foreseeably that year, whenever it lapses for uh, Happy Valley, they will have to go through a whole entire application process and that letter will not be uh, valid anymore. So that is, that's Department of Public Health public, uh, regulation. Um, I don't know when you offered that letter, but one year to the date of them, in, not, not you giving that letter, but them putting in the citing profile to the state uh, is when that expires. Uh, you might actually know that. Mm. <laughs> Requested April 29th, June board 20th, acted June 20th. 20th. So we're getting so close. We're almost there. So if I might, so one, I'd like, to, I'd like Mr. Bogleman to give us some advice, or maybe Mr. Kravitz. Um, I'm wondering why such a rush. I mean, we meet pretty regularly. Uh, I know you had to wait a while to come in and see us, and I'm um, sorry about that. But um, I'd rather cover some of these bases first. I do appreciate that you've made an investment and you have a business plan and of course you'd like to seal the deal mm -hmm. and not um, insensitive to that. But um, you would have to give me a pretty stunning reason why you have to have it tonight because oh. we it's very typical to have people come back after we resolve our questions and we hadn't really heard from you before so we may need a little more time. Uh, understood, understood. It would be, I guess, um, a dereliction of my duty not to request uh, <laughs> is, is with uh, some emphasis. But happy to come back at another time. So this is not a simple transaction because you're not just, they're not issuing a, you're not, they're not requesting you to issue a letter on a site that does not have anything that meets all the other legal requirements. They have not gone through the Zoning Board of Appeals at this point in time. Uh, and also I think this transaction is especially complicated we have not had an initial conversation we, and a substantive conversation about the host community agreement on the medical or the uh, adult use side. And I think this is a complicated one because of the churn in the industry, that there are things that are still, the, for adult use, things are still being decided. And uh, the applicant has been pretty clear that they in, in, uh, in hope to be uh, co-locating these two facilities without knowing what the rules are. So I think it's unreasonable uh, for the, you know, it's not unreasonable for the board to say, we need to think and see what's, how this develops over time, uh, because that's what your responsibility is. So I'm thinking if we send them away to come back, I would want updated plans that reflect the, co the idea of co-location and um, some resolution on our side, maybe working with the applicant on some of the outstanding legal questions. And um, honestly, uh, Ms. Brewer's put a lot of time into the marijuana issue and I think uh, she doesn't miss very many meetings and it would be good to have her included in that final decision. She, she may be shouting at her television. <laughs> uh, I don't know. So I doubt it, given how she's feeling. But, um, but, <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that's the case. Did you, you know, actually to that point, I want to ask Mr. Mr. Bogman, she had suggested an email that we post a meeting in the select board in case a quorum of us show up Wednesday night. Um, I didn't know if you had an opportunity to do that today or not. We, we did not have the opportunity okay. to do that. And, it's not something we typically would do um, Usually because just, you're not going to be, I hope you're not going to be deliberating, deliberating on this because right. it would be an odd thing to do. It was, it was think, an abundance of caution, I yeah, think, on her part Mr. to Kravitz suggest that. Some, did you have something you want to add? Yes, you do have to come up. <laughs> As the viewers may know, Mr. Kravitz has taken the lead on the staff level on all things marijuana, much to his... Uh, yeah, I, sure. I just wanted to clarify that I think the letter of support that, that the select board gave to Happy Valley was specific to 422 Amity Street. I think that any letter of support, if, if one were to 
be given to herbology would be specific to that location. Um, I don't think the Zoning Board of Appeals would issue two special permits. I don't think the Cannabis Control Commission would issue two licenses at the same location. So I think that if there's a general concern about having more than four letters of support out there, we can certainly deal with that. But I think as a practical matter, um, I don't think there's a concern about having two licensed entities at the same location. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. It's not a concern. Okay. It, that's what you're saying to us. It's not a concern to have two out on the same site. Right. I, I, you're yeah, suggesting one supplants the other? Two, for, for two reasons. They I think at, at a bare minimum, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is not allowed to issue, um, it's not allowed to locate two marijuana facilities owned by two different operators within 300 feet of each other. So they could not issue two special permits at the same location uh, for local permitting. And I so would we could, imagine we that- We could issue two letters though for the same location, but- Right, and not have the concern that two okay, would actually Okay, because only one operate. can get a permit. Um, okay, and that I can helps with that, okay. Confirm that with the building commissioner if that would be helpful um, or talk to council about something that seems maybe more complicated. They still have other, other right. concerns. Any other comments from my colleagues on this? I, I'm I, I think that uh, given the amount of time that Ms. Brewer has spent on this general issue of uh, marijuana laws and regulations, it's unfortunate that she had the flu this evening, but I'm glad that since she has knows. the flu that uh, she's not here. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, um, but I would very much like to have her as a part of this discussion, and for that reason, um, and to give us time to get answers to the questions, I would prefer that we uh, not have a motion tonight. Okay. I'm just to concur with my colleagues, I'm feeling the same way. I personally want to sort of per let this percolate a little bit and think about it a little bit. It's not, I have no positive or negative feelings per se, uh, I want to, but I do want to think about it in context of, we know a lot more now than we did a year ago when we were doing these and we're thinking about it differently and the, the, the component of recreational and its intersection with the medical is, is a much different circumstance than what we were experiencing in, in the previous uh, time frame. So, so that's, I personally want to give a little more thought to, and I know that I appreciate Ms. Brewer's thinking about those kind of things, because she's definitely spent a lot of time thinking about those things. Mr. Wall, do you have anything to add, or are you sort of of the same mindset? So I think we're going to not take any action tonight, but we appreciate you coming in and sharing with us uh, where you are, and, and uh, you know, we, uh, we've had a long-standing support for medical marijuana in, in both in the vote of the town, and, and also this board has been uh, aware of its potential to help people who are suffering with different kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, we, we do uh, take these things seriously and want to, to be successful if they do uh, come to our community. So thank you for your time tonight. Um, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you for that. Good. Mr. Kravitz. <laughs> and thank you. And I, you all received invitation to the uh, meeting on Wednesday evening? Correct. Okay, great. So we hope to see as many of you as you can without breaking any open meeting laws. Or we'll, take, we'll take care of our end of it. Okay. Thank you for having us. Thank Appreciate you your time. Much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do we need a break or are we okay? To I need a short break. All right, why don't we take a, a quick recess for a couple of minutes and, and let me stretch our legs and then we'll come back to our agenda.
not on the agenda. Can we even take those articles off? <laughs> even if we want to? <laughs> We're tempting though. So next on our agenda is the uh, Town Manager Performance Goals Update and Review. Mr. Bachman, would you like to take yes. us through your Thank memo you, to us? Chair. Um, I don't plan on going through in detail, but I did want to note that um, as we talked, as we spoke last time um, at the two-month review, that we wanted to have a six-month review as well, um, to keep a short leash, I think, is the, was the term. <laughs> Um, but mo mostly because it was, the, it was timely in the sense of um, n noting that there was going to be the election about the charter and was it time and to um, uh, look at what was on the plate and what we had to accomplish over the next few months before August. So I haven't, didn't really start to address that. It's something that uh, we really do need time, perhaps at the retreat or something, to talk about how the board wants to approach uh, the, its activities uh, on the retreat. But I basically updated the report I gave you in November, I think it was. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing if you have specific questions. Much of this, I think, has been reported on the town manager's report uh, previously. But it is nice to have a compendium of uh, all the accomplishments that we as a town or in uh, efforts the town is making. I think it's a pretty impressive list. and. Um, <coughs> This, there's always a lot going on in town, and uh, you've got incredible staff who are working on lots of different issues. And we were just talking during the break about Mr. Kravitz's efforts, uh, along with Miss um, Kruger and Miss uh, Brewer, on medical marijuana. Plus, you know, Miss Fetterman and uh, Miss Breastrep, and you know, building inspector. All kinds of people who are contributing towards really paving new ground because we are. You know, the, I know the MMA tells people to come to our website to look at it, and that's where we want to be because we have such great information, and people put a lot of time into educating themselves in this. So if you have specific questions, I'm not going to walk through everybody with this. Or it's not my intention, at least. Is there anything new that we didn't hear, you know, previous weeks or verbally, just because I haven't had time to read this? Oh, you can always bring it up. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, well, continuous, continually updating on health insurance. Um, let's see. Uh, the ambulance fees with uh, Hadley. There's an article in the paper, which I didn't send to you independently, but it was in the paper. They, they are discussing that. Um, the... Not a lot of, I, I did change a fair amount, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of new that you don't know about? I don't think there, sh there shouldn't be. Um. So I'm going to actually ask one that I saw here, not mm -hmm. because it's necessarily good or bad. Yep. You know, it's like I'm looking under, um, on page five, under number two, under long range. Uh, Planning number two, sustainability and green initiatives. Yep. The uh, second bullet says at least two so additional solar installations are under consideration on private land. The town would seek a pilot payment as used in previous projects. Any any news on those at this point in time? Um, they're both in North Amherst. Uh, they're not in the development phase. There was one that we have a pilot payment. Um, uh, I forget the street it's on, but uh, it's it's a company called Nexamp. Um, it, it's but it's on a farm in. I think on the Sunderland border, I don't know exactly the location, but mm -hmm. they're moving forward and we have executed a 
pilot agreement with them that's identical to the one or similar using the same format as previous pilot programs that you've done. Um, I was looking for number five, and I, I just under four staffing, it's four, and there is no five in that section, and it goes to six. Improving oh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the part you were on, but I was like, there's no five. There's no five. It's, it's Do you see that? Anyway. It's four to six um, as you turn the page here. From page five to page six. It goes four. Did anyway, you see that? It's just a formatting thing. But not a big deal. Not a big deal. <laughs> Unless you omitted a section. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, this is, this is more to your general comment, Mr. Buckelman, about the, um, you know, this transition that we're in moving from um, representative town meeting form of government to a town council form of government, sort of, it, it's, a, it's a big deal and a lot of new territories. So um, we had um, many months ago before we knew the outcome of the vote said that we would devote our next uh, board retreat to dealing with that. It's not until the 28th, but um, it, it, it makes me wonder if, what kind of planning process we might have, probably looking to you in, in large part to structure mm -hmm. the kind of topics. I think we have about three and a half, four hours together because there's really a lot to do. And as we discovered last Monday, lots of questions and they're still kind of, out there and I just, I've been in a number of conversations with people who have given different interpretations of their opinions of what it means now that um, we've passed this change of government and I'm trying to be cautious and tell people we don't actually have those answers yet, that it's an evolving mm -hmm. picture. So I just wanted to, to say that because I don't know where else it'll fit in. I mean, it's not on our agenda to talk about it in any depth, but there's a lot of speculation um, based on what we started talking about, about the transition rules, and um, mm -hmm. it's not really known yet. So I think there's th there's three major mm -hmm. things that, are, that have some urgency. First is, how do we interpret the transition provisions of the charter? And those are coming up in terms of town meeting, but also just actions that the board is taking. Uh, can you issue a letter of non-opposition to a, a medical marijuana facility? You know, it, it can range, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we need, and I think the board needs some guidance from council and really pushing to get that guidance to you, or maybe a conversation with council about how to interpret it and who makes that final determination because it identifies three, uh, the charter identifies the town manager, the town meeting, and the select board as all needing to qualify their actions as to whether it complies with the charter or not. So that's the first one. The second one is that the charter does call on you to create within 30 days of the election a committee to look at the um, changes that have to happen. Um, and this doesn't have to be the sole committee, but it can be, it's the, this is a committee that sort of looks at the legal underpinnings of the government and what has to happen when the council takes office. Um, you've, uh, the, th the third one, I'm on that one. It, the, t the clock is ticking. The third one you already did, the, the, which was you put the question right. Uh, right. on the ballot and or on the ballot on the uh, special town meeting warrant, and that is will move forward expeditiously. And then the fourth one is sort of are all the other things that we need to think about from you know structure to, to make sure that town is ready to welcome a new council and the council is ready to take action once it, it assembles. And that's a longer term process. It mean, I think it means visiting a lot of other communities and helping to think about it. We're not the first town to have done this. Um, initially reaching out to lots of communities um, and to other organizations and to the state for support and to see if we can get more professional help uh, through funding from other places to say, are you available to help us with this process? Because I think having, um, being able to guide that through a staff and elected board committee would be or, or separate committees however you think best to to run this i think it's a it's going to be a pretty time intensive period of time for the next six months or so so just to follow up how are we going to get that committee appointed within 30 days and do we know what we'll we're have doing? to be on your agenda either next week or the week after okay so but i think that one the the one that is prescribed by the the charter in the 30 days is is very it's a narrow. It's yeah, a very no, narrow no, but we have to get it done. It may be a very done. small group. That's not the 
everybody help us think through how we're going to do right. this. this That's is a different about, it's process. essentially a bylaw kind of review. Right. Yes. Right. I believe so. But we have well. to if do you it. if you envision two different groups doing that, that's the question. Right. For the board. So. So that will be on the agenda because we don't have agenda setting. Right. So we might need to decide that now. It's likely to be on the agenda. <laughs> so your next your next meeting is until next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. So we have an agenda setting, but I, I won't be here tomorrow afternoon. I'm not sure if you're going to be back. I would be back by 4. We, we moved it to 4, but you're not going to be back. I won't be back in time for that. But you could still go ahead with agenda setting. Uh, Mr. Zomak and Ms. Pupp are yeah. here. We, we sh maybe we should give it a shot and know that we have to do that. All and right. then I won't. I mean, half the agenda is already set yeah. because of the okay. warrant. So maybe we right. can knock it up. But let's remind we have to deal with that. Right. So we can confirm that you have agenda setting tomorrow then. OK. I'll be back by four. Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, one more thing that I just wanted to point out. I mean, the, um, I very much appreciate your memo um, uh, because of my travels this weekend and uh, my activities this afternoon. have not had time to spend too more than glance at it, but I appreciate that I have it to look at and um, that it very much um, reinforces our goal to look at the performance goals is, on a, is an ongoing enterprise, not something that's set in stone at one point in time at the beginning of the year, and never subject to change, is um, so that we only add to it and we never subtract. Mm -hmm. um, in that <laughs> regard, oh, uh, there's shucks. one other change that's very significant, and that is that there are three very important positions within mm -hmm. uh, town mm -hmm. hall where we either have had a resignation or um, will have a retirement in the next couple of months. They're people you rely on very closely. Any town manager would rely on people in those positions. The time to fill those positions is fairly significant. So the amount of time mm -hmm. that might be lost to that um, set of circumstances that I just described does need to be factored into all of our collective thinking about what we can reasonably expect during the, the balance mm -hmm. of this uh, year that we're talking about. I appreciate that. Just so you, maybe that's a new thing that mm -hmm. those the position of, of assistant to the town manager and the town clerk have both been advertised. There are search committees that have been established for those two. Um, internal you know, to interview committees, I guess what they really are. Uh, and then those, those, those processes in place because we want the, those, and we didn't want to advertise until we knew what the charter was doing. Both of those positions mm -hmm. are very really important. They derive much of their work depending on the form of government we have. Uh, so those two positions are moving forward. Um, the treasurer collector we're holding on at this moment in time, mainly because of capacity issues with our HR because in addition to doing these two searches, we're also doing a major, the health insurance is a, takes up an enormous amount of time. We have 22 information meetings scheduled um, with employees, and that's all the same people doing the same work. So at their request, we've got really good people filling in on the treasure side and the collector side. We're, we're very confident in that at this moment in time. Um, you know, we're, we're going to put that one off a bit um, as we examine our operations on the first floor in general. Thank you. Mr. Wall? Uh, I wasn't going to ask a tiny question, but why not? Because you mentioned, I saw you, you did talk about staffing on uh, page five and yeah. six and the things that were just asked about here. But when you talked at the end about committees and communication and you mentioned you might look into a staff person to assist with minutes, would that be something that would be possibly for the assistant the town manager or would it be a new, given all our budgetary pressures and yep. job descriptions and so forth? Well, the budgetary pressures are important. Um, we, um, there are two things. One is who is going to manage the council, and right now that position is an appointment of the council, but we're putting that in the town clerk's job description as that a, a duty of the town clerk. Um, but what that re I think what you're referencing is we're we have a backlog of minutes, right. and um, just I wonder if the new positions were part of that or not. Um, we haven't really explored that explicitly. It's um, because because um, our goal it was going to be to fix the backlog, and I think with Ms. Puppel retirement, her retirement, 
um, she is eager to take on some of these tasks or will or willing I should maybe not eager um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not overstate the case <laughs> no um, but and it and you need someone who knows what they're doing and she certainly knows what she's doing so she's if she has more free time after June where she I think we're looking at some opportunities like that so are there other uh, questions relative to the to the manager's performance goals update and review that we want to mention at this point in time um, if not then I think uh, what we can do is we can move on to our our consent calendar for the evening if someone would like to make a motion or separate those out if, if that be the case um, um, that? do we also need to take positions on oh yeah <laughs> first or do you want I me mean, do you want to go out of order or I think uh, well what I was thinking is that we would do the consent calendar and, and then, come make, and then okay. we can come back to that other and kind of grind through those because they're going to be I think straightforward, but okay. we have already moved um, and passed part A mm -hmm. of the consent calendar. Um, I move to approve the items listed on part B of the consent calendar for April 9, 2018 agenda as presented. Motion and a second. So, for the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And we're unanimous on those. So, thank you for that. And so, at this point, we can probably, I think, the likely thing to do is, is revert toward the beginning of our, uh, our motion sheet because I have a feeling that we have the opportunity to uh, cover several of the articles cover tonight and offer motions and take our actions as necessary so if someone would be so kind as to begin well I do have a question for you and that sure. is is there a reason that we couldn't lump together several of the ones that um, were presented by Ms. Aldrich I have no problem with that uh, Lump. And um, the ones that I was um, thinking of um, initially would might be articles two, three, four, five, six. We could even do seven. Yes, um, because they're all fairly. Um, routine as far as things that have been done in prior years with the one exception of the, the, the structure of the option uh, no I don't even think maybe that's not even within this group the revolving funds actually a separate one right Which um, I so uh, I, before offering that motion or having somebody else offer it, I just wanted to see if there was a point where anybody wanted to pull any of those out for separate consideration. I don't see a reason to. And, and personally, um, for simplicity's sake, I could take those as articles I would speak to at town meeting, um, some of which are all on the consent calendar. So that's. Oh, that's what we're on me, but it looks like it looks impressive oh. when you have seven things to do, right? But I'm happy to take those on because they're mostly straightforward, unless unless there are some that that some other people would like. Has the moderator indicated what is the consent calendar that he intends to propose? Um, he has. Uh, don't know if I have that here though. Okay, it's been marked on the warrant that we had in our thing tonight. Okay, well, I move to recommend um, to the April 30, 2018 annual town meeting Article 2, transfer of funds on paid bills, Article 3, acceptance of optional tax exemptions, Article 4, 2018 budget amendments, Article 5, retirement assessment. Article 6, Regional Lockup Assessment, and Article 7, Other Post-Employment Benefits, OPEP Trust. Second. And uh, 
Mr. Slaughter to speak on behalf of the board at the town meeting. So I remember from past years, and I think it's happened more than once, the OPEB trust has been pulled out by um, somebody at the meeting. So I just think we need to be, it's fine, it, the motion's fine, but whoever is speaking, be prepared to address that in more detail because it may get pulled. I'm, I'm okay to speak to that as well. That's the advantage of having been on the finance committee way back when. <laughs> and the, and the moderating t moderator intends to put it in the consent calendar still. Right. But it has been pulled out a couple times. Right? Yeah. All right. So we have a motion and a second for uh, articles two through seven. Is there further discussion on those? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's unanimous. Um, And with the person absent. Okay, so I got us through two through seven. So now we have Article Eight, which is the 2019 budget, which has there's a couple different pieces to that for this evening. And I think again on on Article Eight. Um, obviously, we, we talked in detail about the library services. I don't know if we want to take up. Um, any, it has its own motion. That's right, I believe it, yes. it That's does. The next, yeah. Well, yeah, it's weird. It has its own motion. So I didn't know whether we wanted to take up um, the general fund budget, which is general government, public safety, public works, conservation development, community services, sewer fund, water fund, solid waste fund, transportation fund, and debt service. Although I don't think, I thought debt service was its own. Article, but maybe not. Well, I have a warrant right here. Um, we didn't have a presentation on it, but that, no, we did that not. may not be typical anyway. I don't know. Who would we ask questions to? Well, those have really um, been presented to us through the town manager's budget, uh, which was given to us in January. And uh, we have had the opportunity, if we have had questions about it, to ask questions all along. Um, I don't think that um, any of us have posed questions on it um, this year. Um, so on that basis? So on that basis, I would feel comfortable if we decided to go ahead this evening and feel comfortable if we decided to postpone it one night um, and I'd also um, be willing to have my name listed not that I would intend to speak to anything other than um, indicate support since it will be motions of the finance committee and to answer questions to the extent that I'm able to do so as they arise again like Mr. Slaughter, having uh, served on the Finance Committee, has enough familiarity with the structure of how this is done and the content and how to uh, read the budget that's presented to us, which I have done to the extent that I could. So in that case, the motion on our motion sheet includes the, the uh, does not include the school's budgets, which makes it easier for me. Uh, it doesn't include the library budget, it makes it easier for Mr. Seinberg. So we could take that motion up tonight if we were so inclined. So if we, someone would like to make that motion, um, I would entertain it. You want to make it since you're, no, oh, the, the one for the general fund? You can go ahead. Uh, I move to recommend um, to the April 30th, 2018 annual town meeting, article eight, um, FY 2019 general fund budget, which includes general government, public safety, public works, conservation and development, community services, sewer fund, water fund, solid waste fund, transportation fund, and debt service. And Mr. Steinberg to speak to that on behalf. So motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's unanimous with one absent. 
Would be willing to make, make the next one as a motion, then we can discuss it. Please uh, go right ahead. I move to um, recommend to the April 30th, 2018 annual town meeting, Article 8, FY 2019 library operating budget in the amount of $2,683,069 with town support tax with town tax support of one million nine hundred and ninety three dollars ninety one million nine hundred and ninety three thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars must be getting tired uh we yeah. decide later yeah <laughs> news to speak to that i mean i i i guess i i could take that one or mr wald yeah. mr wald's a, a friend of the library so I'm happy to get I that. I can do it either. Mr. Wall to speak? Okay. All right. Want him to happen. So is there further discussion on that one? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we have an abstention and an absence. And no nos. No nos. So that was a 3-1-1 vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotta find my. So now we have, uh, I believe next is Article 11, which is general bylaw. Article 9. Oh, 9. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Uh, the reserve fund. So we can take a motion on that one. If inclined. I recommend um, to the April 30. 2018 annual town meeting article 9 reserve funds Mr. Steinberg to speak on behalf of the article on behalf of the select board at town meeting second thank you is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. that's unanimous with one absent that one may also get lumped into the consent calendar I'm not sure mm -hmm. that may be also there all right, so now we'll do Article 11, if someone would like to make a motion on that one. And this is a little more involved, I think, this year as far as explaining it. Um, the effect is the same as every other year we've done this, but I think that because of the... I think he's putting this in the consent calendar, even though it has a different form. I, I can't remember that possibly, though. Okay. But it, it really sort of makes, makes things permanent. Um, and while there's some hesitation by council relative to the new charter and bylaw changes, this is required by state, state law, law right. so we kind of have to. Um, also, would note that uh, future council could always reverse it. I think that there's nothing that keeps a town from reversing under this provision. Yeah. So that it hasn't taken away from the future council if they decided that they didn't want to see this revolving fund continue the ability to make that determination at a future date that's correct so permanent would, isn't always permanent yeah. i would move to recommend uh to the april 30 annual town meeting article 11 general bylaw revolving fund authorization mr steinberg to speak reauthorization Re mr steinberg to a second? Second. Is there further discussion? No. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one absent. And so I think what we typically do on 25 and 26 is defer our decision in town, town meeting because we don't, know. we don't know if there's going to be any dollars in there or not. Mm -hmm. So we'll hold off on those, I think, for now. Um, and the not controversial, but. Right. Okay, so that takes care of uh, things under the actual items under action and discussion for the warrant for this evening. Uh, don't we have a whole bunch of holdovers? That could be. Do we have that on our motion? Back on your motion sheet, yeah. Oh. We're going to do those. Well, <laughs> now sounds like a perfect time to me. <laughs> I mean, we might want to defer on some of it. Correct. <clears throat> so if, if people would like to make um uh, motions relative to those um i will say this uh you know just speaking of sort of taking ownership of some of these things 
Uh, reports boards and committees, I'm happy to speak to that one. Not that it takes more than about two seconds to say we. I'm checking you off on that. Um, but I also think, you know, uh, f the easements, um, there's a few on those. So let's see, Article 19. Right. Um, declaration of use, Article 20, is that in 21 is an easement yes. and 22. And are you going to be presenting those at warrant review? I am. Because they had your name down for yes, these. Yes, I will. I know Groff Park is different, but I wonder if one one of us, whoever, could do 19, 20, 21, and 22. I think I could do those because, again, I think most of these are really straightforward. So as far as, you know. And you'll have already had to present something for warrant review. Exactly. So between now and tomorrow evening, I'll <laughs> be fully prepped. I believe I'm going to have some time tomorrow, but that's a whole different thing. So, and, and for that purpose, we could probably actually, much like we did earlier, we could probably make the recommendation. Recommendation is one motion instead of oh. like five of these. I now think. I remember. It, it, I think but rescission of bond authorization 18 goes with coal, right? So. But it doesn't say this on here, isn't that the? That is correct. So we so should that can be add one, that. I just, that can be in there as well. Call, yeah, I got it. So and that I, and actually again, goes with it. And I'm happy to speak to that as well. Yeah. Okay. So those we've clumped these or lumped these. So if we could, we could have a motion. I, would, I think we can. Can we? Can I read them all and then take one vote? Or? Yeah, that's what I was hoping okay. we would do. Okay, see if I can figure this. Uh, I move to recommend to the April 30th, 2018 annual town meeting. I'm going to read them all. Article 18, rescission of bond authorization. Article 19, acquisition of easement coal property. Article 20, dedication of use Groff Park. Article 21, acquisition of easements multiple ways. Article 22, Acquisition of land or easements, Harlow Drive and Rolling Ridge Road. It's a typo on the motion sheet, but not a big deal. Um, okay, that's it. Mr. Slaughter, speak to that. Okay. Is there a second? Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So Could have thrown one absent. <coughs> Um, we could take Can I modify my motion and add Article 23 as well? Um, Second or object if I add 23? <laughs> True. I, I thought I heard you said 23 already. I think she stopped at 22. I didn't. I think I, I meant to say 23, and I'm, I'm I heard correcting. 23, yes, that's right. <laughs> It's a, it's we'll think it's a friendly amendment. So it's 18, a, uh, just to get the records, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, Mr. Slaughter to speak. Yes. Without objection, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, do we generally take a position on Article 1? Just since it's, it's, or do we leave that I one? I think if, if the moderator just, this is, you just said this is something we always do. Right. I don't know if we need to, but yeah, we'll come back to it if someone's. Anyway, sure. So um, something tells me 26 isn't the right number for this, the, the uh, East Street School. Let's find out. Because 26 just a minute ago was served. Um, this is the sheet from when we Right. Uh, it's 27. That's what I thought. Yep. It's 26 is stabilization fund. Solution. That's not on the on the warrant. That needs. Oh. That can yeah, we we're not taking that one. Yeah. Okay. So, so. The authorization to transfer a property East Street School. Um, again, I think I will take that one because yeah. I'm on the trust. So I will yeah. take that as a as an article. And then I may have to actually stop taking articles. I'm <laughs> taking the whole warrant. Well, that one has more. This problems. one actually has a. a I'll I'll read it just mm -hmm. just to get it in the record. Um, I move to recommend to the April 30th, 2018 annual. Town meeting, Article 27, authorize and transfer of property, East Street School to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust for affordable housing. And then I, once we have a second, I'm hoping we can have a minute to talk about this one. Okay, and Mr. Slaughter to speak to it. Oh, and Mr. Slide didn't say, yes, yes I'm sorry. So and Mr. Slaughter to speak to it on behalf of the trust. And so you had a comment or? Well, a couple things um, before we vote. 
Um, we, we talked about this last time because it, it came off, it was back on. I think the language mm -hmm. we have now is different than what we saw last time. Um, we, at one point, I think via some emails, there was something from Mr. Blackman about whether this would be sponsored by the trust or the select board. It is still the select board article that didn't change. I, I thought it might. Um, I know the trust will want to speak to this, but there, um, the language changed from what we saw before. So we, to, to just, before we take a vote, I think we should be aware of the content a little bit. Piece of property didn't change. The no, didn't but change. we had an issue on the with council's yeah. advice, yeah. and we authorized Mr. Bachelman to act on our behalf to try to resolve that. And what we yeah. have is different. Uh, including the last sentence. So the key um, sentence was. Uh, was the last sentence where it says, provided, however, that the town shall not convey that said property to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust until the town council, deter town council meaning the elected body, sure. determines that a feasible project meaning the above objectives has been identified, financing commitments have been obtained, and key permits have been secured. That is language that was recommended by our town attorney, which is how we're <laughs> learning to say that from now. Um, I should note that I had discussed this with Mr. Hornick prior to that. Um, he was not s supportive of this language, but my feeling was this is the language the town, our town attorney had given us, um, and he acquiesced, um, understanding that he was happy to have it on the warrant, but I think th there is still a bit of conversation to be had with you and the town attorney about exactly what the mo main motion will be. So I, wa I wanted you to be aware, Mr. Slaughter. Thank you. We, we had said last time, you know, let's get a placeholder and try to get it where we think at least our attorney's comfortable for now. And if we have to do the series of discussions and amendment later, that's always a possibility that we, you know, loath to do that if we don't have to. So I just wanted, I had been made aware of the change. I, looked for this and then I, I had talked to Mr. Hornick briefly because he reached out to me, but just wanted us to know going forward, this was the change up to address the attorney's concern last time and um, it brings up some questions for, for trust members. So are, are we, well, that then, given that it has some slight changes from what we last saw, do we want to take a position tonight? Do we want to think about it some we more? We should wait so we can hear I'm, them. I'm leaning a little bit toward maybe yeah. waiting. Yeah. Um, contemplate this yeah. a bit more and yeah and uh good i just wanted to so we can that. we can hold off on on that did you actually make the motion she did it was did. there's uh, a motion on the floor so do you want to res can we rescind we can just not vote on it too you can also not vote on it or we can rescind if the seconders I'll, whatever is I'll, I'll withdraw it uh, draw? okay give us time to catch up with the new information is okay as long as it's all right i think we've figured that out we should have discussed before i moved but i moved and then discussed all right. So 20, Ag Commission is actually 28? Right. Mm -hmm. So changes right. to the Ag Commission is 28. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to get all of these because you're the I know. I, this one I will also take because I am the liaison <laughs> to that. My committee's been busy. I don't know what you guys have been up to, but I've been working with my groups. Oh. I'm just kidding. Not me. I'm just lounging around. Yeah, the downtown parking working group. You just don't have anything that comes to town meeting. <laughs> That's the thing. Between tomorrow, no big deal. Ah. But I'm, ho I'm open to an, uh, a motion with regard to this. If someone well, Since I just mucked up the last one, I'll let someone else do this. <laughs> I have to recommend to the April 30, 2018 Annual Town Meeting Article 28 amend vote establishing the Agricultural Commission, Mr. Slaughter, to speak on behalf of the select board at town meeting. Second. Motion and second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous with one absent. So 
this this last one I, I will discuss before moving and I Thank think you. this is one that we understood must be on the warrant because it's a petition article but would be disqualified from action this may fall it was chair yes please this may fall into that let's get better clarity from town council right. bucket of, of right. items so yeah. right. for me that would fall into let's wait right right I think that I think as we get a greater clarity about what cannot be acted on I think then then that'll be its own classification of of action that we take instead of recommend not recommend recommend deferral dismissal sort of it may be its own sort of flavor or uh, to, as you heard before this is another item mm -hmm. that right Tom Turney has said right in that regard in slaughter uh, the dissolution of the recycling refuse management committee has been removed altogether now yes correct right. I believe so yes yeah. It is on the motion sheet. It should not be on the motion sheet. Because right. I think she just stapled the one it's from the not in the warrant. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. No, I was just yeah. clarifying. The, yeah. Just for sure. the record. And that's why the numbers are. Do we have motions for the yeah. special? Well, we don't. Okay. That's a good point. By the way. So in our in our packet we had the special town oh. meeting which is at 6:59. I'm sure it'll only take a moment. <laughs> to do that. Of course. One minute exactly. Um, and there are two articles on that. We do not have uh, motions on our motion sheet tonight. And I'm not sure it's expressly in our in our um, in our agenda. But I wanted to make you aware that it's there, and that we will probably do that next, next week. So when we do, Mark or right. Try to right. Okay. So I think we've taken action on as many as we can. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I think next up on our agenda is the town manager report. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you have for us? Everything. Uh, yes. I want to alert that, uh, the members that um, Ms. Kruger and Mr. Steinberg and I will be presenting at the Zero Net Energy Building Advisory Council tomorrow in Boston. This is a committee of um, the most advanced thinkers on zero net energy for buildings in Massachusetts. It was set up um, several years ago. It meets, it's a large group that meets twice a year. Um, and we've been allocated an entire hour on their agenda to talk about the bylaw that's been passed by, um, by the town meeting and by the changes that we've been working on in, in the time since town meeting. So it's an exciting opportunity. It's an opportunity for, to hear from a lot of experts about how we've approached it and the changes we're making to the bylaw. It'll be an interesting session, I think. So, and we have a large crew from Mothers Out Front and from the um, people on, you know, the select board members and the chair of the DPW Fire um, Station Advisory Committee going and the Superintendent of Public Works going, going as well. So it should be a really good meeting. Just wanted to mention that. Great, great presentation going out. Um, reminder that we have the Amherst Economic Development Forum on Wednesday, April 25th. Wednesday? Is it Wednesday? Um, yeah, uh, from 6 to 8 in the town room. This is one of the, our first public session on uh, economic development being led by Mr. Kravis, but also the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission who received the contract to do the study on economic development. It's one of our important studies that we're moving forward on. Um, the, um, the town has in your, in your packet, or in, on your desk, there were um, some information. We have been going, um, we had three today, going out to the, uh, as, as I told you before, we're uh, meeting with um, at every work site uh, so today we're at the North Fire Station at 7 a.m. We were at Town Hall at 11 p.m. and at Fort River at 3.30 to do presentations to employees and retirees about the changes being done to the um, health insurance plan. Uh, we had 50, at, um, 50 people, uh, mostly employees at Fort River. Um, and so this, these are, we're doing two or three a day and we have 22 scheduled in total, uh, the, the sessions. People are very actively interested in the changes. It's the most important benefit that we provide to them. And so I put, just put out in, at your desk some of the information we're handing out so you get a sense of the types of information that people are getting as we talk this through. Um, you know, I think it's mostly the people who are attending, some have concerns about the change at all, 
but for the most part, they just want to understand what's it mean to me. And I think we have a, a large number of staff from Blue Cross, from town staff, and from Maya, who is our, going to be our new provider there to answer individual questions uh, in groups or in one-on-one -on -one sessions. So those are going well. Um, also want to let you know that um, a couple weeks ago, I attended a um, meeting that hosted by Mayor Narkowitz in Northampton um, to talk about the um, community choice um, aggregation, which was not the normal, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's not the normal aggregation. It was to decide if there were three communities, Pelham, Amherst, and Northampton, who were interested in pursuing this. The um, makeup of the committee um, would be the three energy staff from the three communities, um, a designee um, from, from each community, either from the select board and from the mayor, um, and then a number of other people, the UMass uh, CEE staff, and then three members from the, the sort of advocates who brought this forward. And the purpose of this would be to um, see if there's, a, uh, if there's interest in this plan and what the path going forward would be and they'd be responsible for seeing if there were funds out there or not. Um, so um, it's, it's something they're, they're starting to ramp up on, and um, we'll talk some more about this in a little more coherent way um, and, uh, next, at your next meeting. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz was to get advice on whether this group that was as constituted would be subject to the open meeting law, um, and, and if it is, then they will comply with that. And that's, that's basically, that's, those are all the only items I have for you tonight. Thank you, other questions for the manager relative to those things? <clears throat> Seeing none, <laughs> we'll move on to member reports. I have a rather extensive one to give tonight, so I may wait on that if others have things they want to offer as member reports. I think for Mr. Wall. Yeah, I, I, I um, Is that what you're saying about that? Yeah, I think that the <laughs> thing that was, um, I wanted to expand a little bit on um, where we are with zero energy and a question that has arisen that was referenced earlier about a possible item not considered 48 hours prior to the meeting. Um, we have had one final meeting uh, with the group for Mothers Out Front, uh, we being uh, Ms. Kruger and myself, Mr. Bachman and Ms. Griesmer. Um, Except that I wasn't there, but yeah. Yeah, and um, we uh, were talking about the process between now and the presentation at town meeting including the mailing of a one-page summary. And um, the question that um, came up was, um, who should be the sponsors of the one-page summary? Is, should it be co-sponsored, co-listed by the select board and mothers out front? Um, certainly the group that was working on the bylaws not any not a legally constituted group we were working on behalf of two different groups and so we were just trying to get clarity about whether it would be appropriate since it is a town it is a select board motion um, an article at town meeting um, whether the summary um, can show that it is presented to in the mailing that will go out it would be in the second mailing uh, as, as coming from the select board as well as from the Mothers Out Front group. So then we got to, we don't have permission <coughs> yet because we didn't ask, we're representing this group, but we didn't want to put select board on that um, document and we could either talk about it tonight or wait until the meeting on the 18th because there'd still be time for the second mailing, but I guess I was kind of hoping that we, if we got that answer, we might finalize that document, we might be able to use it to refer to it tomorrow night or whatever, just seem like an opportunity to make that decision 
now if it's appropriate under the strictures of our agenda. Right. So I think that could fall under topics not recently anticipated. Um, um, because it does require a certain timeliness because if we wait, then you won't be here. Right. So that meeting happened Friday morning, so that wouldn't right. have been that would have been less than right. That would certainly fall within the forty eight hour before our current meeting. So it is, I think, appropriate to, to discuss this evening. Um, I guess the, the question I have is, given your, the two of your um, closeness to it, is do you have a comfort level with it being a co-sponsored information page, or would you prefer a different arrangement? I mean, what's your current level of comfort, discomfort? Um, since the process has involved um, a group that included the four that I named and four people who represented mothers out front, and we worked very collaboratively to move from bylaw that was passed by town meeting to a proposal to substitute this new bylaw in its place to town meeting, um, I think that we're very comfortable with it. The key section is that it identifies in a, um, seven um, points from the original bylaw that are modified and how they are modified within the new bylaw, which are the major points of change. Um, it is all on a single page, so um, that's the bulk of what is present, a little bit of explanation of the process that got us there. Um, but I think it's fairly straightforward, factual explanation um, without throwing any value judgments from anybody into the document. And right, and I, I agree. And just to explain the process a little, so at the meeting prior to the Friday, last Friday morning, I had offered to draft something, and I did a first draft, and I sent it to everybody, and that was discussed at the Friday morning meeting, I couldn't be there. And um, Rudy Perkins from the Mother at Front group took it and wanted to do some changes and then sent it around this weekend. And because the way we've taken to working, no one finalizes any documents without everybody seeing it and weighing in and making changes. So there were, um, Rudy had come up with this comparison chart as a replacement for some of the descriptive of what we did. And I thought that that was fine, but then we got into, I, I had drafted it with select board mothers out front, and he had a, a different idea was of like the working group, whatever. We still have to resolve that, but I, um, I think at that point we realized we had to come and ask the select board if we could put select board on this. Just, but I don't have any problem with the content, and it's. I think to do the to send out the the warrant and in the packet and not have some way to talk about what it is ahead of time before we get to the floor town meeting would be a mistake. So that attempt was to introduce to people what it was, why were we doing this, and what had we done, and what were we doing now that was different. Right. So the urgency on this is that the material for the second packet are due, is due the 17th. Because of the holiday on the 16th, you're not meeting to the 18th. Oh. So that's, and we didn't know about this in advance. So if, and the question is, right now is going to have the working group, which two members of the board will be signing on to, do you want to have the select board approves also? Just, just, that's basically what you're asking, right? Mr. Wald, any offering? Well, that would, I had a somewhat different idea to you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Kruger's book. So it's our motion, I mean, our article. Mm -hmm. And you wrote a draft, and then it got circulated and chewed up and regurgitated. Modified, yeah. I mean, is there a reason? So are we, your preference now is to have the name of this working group, which has no official status on it? Um, I don't really think that the memo to town meeting should come from a working group that was a working title for us that isn't actually an entity. Yeah. It's it has it's a group that with representatives. Um, the um, I mean it, I mean we could say it's just ours, but I think that defeats the purpose of the collaboration that we worked on. And since it mothers out front 
got the first version passed, um, there's a sense that they need to play a key role in representing why they are agreeing to change it. Well, I guess my question is, if it's a select board motion, is there anything wrong with having a select board statement that indicates the origins of the article and the collaborative process? I mean, is it a, is it a question of who's having more than one name on it, or? No, the, uh, the question is if the select board's name on it, is on it, do we have authorization to represent the select board on this summary document along with Mothers Out Front? And I'm sorry, but you, and, and you don't have it. We so have you're, you're authorizing okay. something you don't have. So right. that's a little dicey, but we could certainly send it out. But it's not done yet. It's not right. quite Trust done. my colleague's judgment. Yeah. So. Right, I, I agree. And I think that if, you know, the, the you get down to sort of brass tacks, it's we would like the changes made to the bylaw to make it functional. And so if this, helps that along and again given what Mr. Wall said we trust your judgment as far as content, content. and that sort of thing I'm certainly fine with with that moving representing ahead. the yeah. but yeah. this is from the board and right. from the other group cause that's right because we've seen the, the actual yes. article so we know what's in that right. and so right. and, that's and, not and we're comfortable with that so I think I don't know if we need to take a formal motion on that or not I, I would if if someone wanted to offer one but I, I don't think we necessarily have to but, but we the record can show that we agreed to that. And, um, consensus or, or whatever. Um, are there other member reports? So I just have uh, one, but it's a, it, it will be a little involved. Um, PVTA advisory board met today at 2 o'clock. Um, we took up a number of issues relative to the upcoming fiscal year. Um, as you are aware of in March, mostly, uh, there were a couple of things brought before the public and public hearing process, uh, one of which was a change in the fares charged, and the other was reductions in services to uh, try to balance the fiscal 19 budget based on the governor's budget, which was uh, reverting back to um, essentially a fiscal year 15 a funding level for the regional transit authorities. Um, uh, the full you know, process has been gone through, and so what the board voted today was to have a 20% uh, increase in fares, uh, which is significant, but it also, there's some logic to it because A, we haven't had a change in fares in more than a decade, and B, it makes the dollar amounts go from a dollar and a half to a dollar 75. Uh, is that correct? Let me, let me make sure I can tell you the right number. So, um, but it makes the the um, the amounts more useful for for riders. One of the complaints in the in the hearing process was, uh, you know, going to a dollar sixty, which would have been a twenty five percent increase, which is what we had gone out uh, to the public with, was an unwieldy amount. I'm sorry, the current fare is a dollar dollar and a quarter. The proposed amount would be a dollar fifty. A twenty five percent increase. That's not as to, bad. That's, what that's not heard. nearly as bad. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, so, they, to so current fares are $1.25. The proposed amount would be $1.50. Uh, and there are a number of other changes of that similar sort throughout the entirety of the different types of, uh, I believe they called it uh, fair media, because mm -hmm. you can buy 31 day passes or week passes and that sort of thing. Um, but the idea was to try to stay as much as possible with fairly round numbers that worked with quarters, quite frankly, because that was a lot of the feedback is, is um, the way the fares work when you're actually on the bus is what you put into the, the fare box stays in the fare box. It doesn't offer change back to you. So uh, having quarters is a little easier for people. Um, so the board did vote to uh, raise fares uh, effective July 1st. Um, the other action that was taken was uh, relative to reduction in service. And on that front, we, um, the, the advisory board took a more nuanced approach, I guess the best way to say it. So after going through the public hearing process, they take that feedback, they modify the actual proposal to the, to the board to try to mitigate uh, disproportionate uh, impacts. Um, disparate and disproportionate, there's definitions of all that. Um, and so the, the other piece that sort of people have, we've realized in doing this is that there are uh, some timing issues with how routes get bid by drivers so that they uh, essentially it creates effective dates um, but one of the issues would be is if we made the new changes effective they would take effect March, May 13th in our region June 23rd in in the southern part of the PVTA 
And we realized that if the, the legislature and the governor, you know, fund the RTAs at a higher level, then we would be reversing the process potentially for September, and we'd have to go through the whole analysis process and public hearing process again. So what the board did today was made a recommendation of changes to service, not quite as severe uh, as what was originally proposed, the idea being to try to uh, more riders were inconvenienced, but fewer riders were left without an option. So that was two of the sort of critical things when they, when they made the modifications was to try to reduce the number of people that can't get there from here. They, may, they can now get there from here. It just may take longer. So that's, that's really the sort of simplistic way of describing it. But we made it effective uh, September 1st pending uh, or contingent upon how the funding plays out with the state. So if the state funding comes into play, there's a prioritization of those, those changes. And so uh, if the state funding comes in and can, you know, we can keep service at where it's at, we'll keep service where it's at. If it's less than that, then there's a prioritized list which will be in effect. Um, but the rate change to fares will be in effect regardless. Um, but the other will likely take effect in September. So I want to make people aware of that and the PVTA website and, and I can get materials uh, for our website as well relative to those changes and, and when they'll be effective. So I, I wanted to mention that in, in somewhat probably excruciating detail just because it's, it's a pretty big change and there's a number of routes, a number of routes in our area that, that are affected. Um, the, the lion's share of effects uh, are things like Saturday's take on Sunday or uh, uh, Sunday schedules to some extent. They've modified that a little bit, um, but it's a reduction in service, not as many late running shifts longer time spans between shifts uh, or routes, um, those kinds of things. And so uh, it, depending on how the, the budget plays out in the next few months, it, it, none of it may take effect, which would be in some ways the best uh, because the service would stay intact. But if not, some of it will, will be taking effect. Um, it's always a difficult process. Um, I had gone to a legislative, uh, the, the MARTA, which is the Massachusetts <coughs> Regional Transit Authority Association, who is a central for all the RTAs working with the legislature on things, uh, had a luncheon uh, a little over a week ago. Uh, I think I reported on that a little bit. Um, you know, they're, they're still working to, uh, to try to promote uh, funding for the RTAs because of, um, you know, all of them are affected negatively by a, a funding level that the governor proposed. Um, and all of them are going through similar sort of processes of how do we have a budget that, that works and, and when can we change our, our, uh, our routes and, and still comply with the, the regulation around, around route changes and that sort of thing. So um, we'll keep an eye on it as, as time proceeds and as the budgets play out, but uh, hopefully um, funding levels will come up a little bit and it won't be as much of a change to the, to the PVTA service. So that's that, and that was really the only uh, uh, report I had, but I did want to go into some detail on it for you folks. Um, and so I'm glancing at our, there are no other member reports. I don't see anything else on our agenda. Did you have anything, Mr. Wall? Last week. Uh, since last week. All right. So if that's the case, then I, I would certainly entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. 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 <laughs> All those out. in favor, please say aye. 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 And so we're adjourned at 931. Thank you, Amherst Media.